Hello, my name is No Sweat. Um, a lot of my friends call me No Sweat, and a lot of my friends call me Robbie. I prefer to be called No Sweat. That's my pen name. I've written six books and hundreds of articles under that name. And uh, it's my version of being Mark Twain. Mark Twain meant everything was all right on the river, deep enough to bring a steamboat through, and No Sweat means everything's likewise. Uh, today I want to talk about two different things with this video and my racing pigeons, my family of Sions. I want to talk about some of the matings that I'm putting together um, and why I've put those birds together for 2022, the babies for 2022, and I also want to talk about colors with racing pigeons. Um, there's a whole lot about color that's never mentioned or talked about, and I hope to cover a little bit lightly some of those issues today. Later on, I'm going to do nothing but a solid one video on nothing but color. And I hope not to talk about color in the same way that uh, everyone else has talked about color that are so-called so experts. <clears throat> There's a lot more to color than just something being recessive and dominant. Uh, I want to talk about, if you'll see here right now, I've got four, four setups. I did used to have six in here, but right now I'm just working with four. Four different pairs in my mating room. If you're going to raise early hatches, uh, you want to start out usually right around Thanksgiving or maybe even a day or two before Thanksgiving. By the time you put the two birds together and by the time they actually take with each other, and usually you can tell if a pair is uh, fell in love with each other and mated because they'll start roosting together. Once you see them sitting together, kind of loving each other, then you know they're probably a mated pair. So sometimes it takes longer than others. Uh, this particular pair here, this first pair that I'll talk about, uh, it's sort of a dream mating. This is a, this will be an all, these will be, a, uh, I think it's gonna be a fantastic mating. Uh, like I've said before, a real test of a pigeon, a really good pigeon man is a person who can put two birds together, fantastic pigeons together and breed babies out of them that are better than both parents. Not the same, we're almost as good, but birds that are better. Uh, I've put a medium small size hen, this blue hen here, which is a full sister, which is a full sister to a hen that I flew in South Africa, which was named Summertime. In Summertime, more than likely, I never did get to handle her after she got over it. And I can tell she's, get, she's got an egg inside of her right now, this hen, I'm gonna set her back up there. You can tell when a hen's got an egg, she'll get you know, swell up a little bit in here, and you can, if you've handled enough pigeons, this hen will probably lay today or tomorrow. I don't want to be handling her too much right now, but I can feel the ache inside of her. She's a full sister to Summertime, and again, Summertime led the entire United States in South Africa two years before uh, the last race they had in South Africa. On average speed, she was first in the United States on about five of the 25 or 30 tosses they had prior to that, and she was sixth in the world. And this is a beautiful size pigeon that has the right kind of eye and everything. Classic Leroy Sion. She has sort of a grayish pearl eye. Beautiful, beautiful size. This pair didn't like each other at all. She had been mated, I'd had her mated to her full brother, trying to keep that blood. And I've had, this is on 96. He's a, he's a, he's been mated to Number 33, the black-eyed hen, which flew 700 miles. I've had him mated to her for three years. So I broke him off, and they weren't, they didn't fall in love immediately, but now they're in love now. And like I said, she's getting ready to lay, and you can see the little setup I have here. Little nest up there, get their water, put the feet underneath, and uh, I put them down some grit. It's not the super clean, but this is the right size to mate a, mate a pair with. Uh, he's the bird that flew 500 miles as a young bird, and he had seven full brothers and sisters that also flew 500 miles as a young bird. They were all out in the same nest in the same year. And uh, he goes back on the old Heisman Sion blood and is everything that Heisman looked for in a pigeon. He's a medium sized cock bird. He's the last bird I've got left out of that, out of that pair of birds. And he's an extremely valuable. Um, I'm gonna get into talking about colors, but anytime you made a blue bar, that's what the color of this bird is. Anytime you made a blue bar back onto a blue bar, that's what you're gonna breed. You're actually mating two recessives together. Recessive color-wise, between the red and black gene, the, the, the blue or black gene is a 
is recessive. And then when you fool with bars, you're fooling with the recessive also in color pattern versus uh, checks and velvets and other color patterns. So when you made a recessive to a recessive, it becomes a dominant trait. And uh, so that's what you're gonna be breeding. It is possible to break two blue bars together and produce birds that have white flights or splashes, but you will never make two blue bars together and ever raise a red check out of them. If you get a red check or a silver bar out of two or a grizzle out of two blue bars, a red grizzle, then there's uh, something wrong. There's been another pigeon that's entered into the scene. But with two blue bars, you're pretty well sure that you're going to get a blue bar, and you know, and you may get some a white flight or something that can be in the background. Uh, back when I used to show birds, uh, we were fanatics on breeding blue bars that had. That's, this is the back of a pigeon. This is a light color, like a white back. But we would try to breed birds that actually didn't have a white back at all, and I would try to breed blue bars that had all black toenails. We were that much a fanatic on it. We wanted black beak. We wanted black toenails, all of them, and we wanted a gray back. So we were real strong color disciplinarians, and you wanted you had to pay a lot more attention about color in doing that. We considered those other things as flaws because we wanted everything on the bird to be harmonious and perfect. Uh, with racing, not quite so much more. You know, it's really funny in racing because people say color doesn't make any difference. You don't care what color a bird is when it comes in off a of race. But that's not true at all. Uh, there are people that love certain particular colors, and color does matter. It matters in nature, and it also matters when doing people are doing selective breeding. Um, and there's reasons why uh, at Victoria Falls and South Africa and the Hoosier that a huge majority of the birds, I wouldn't guess, don't know the exact ratio, but almost 90% just guessing uh, of the birds are blue bars. So if color doesn't matter, I don't, why are they all blue bars? Uh, it does matter. It matters in showing, it matters in racing. And blue bars is, a, is for some reason, the, the base color of all the racing pigeons. Everybody loves a blue bar. Hayes has got a lot of personality. I put this pair together. This is, this is a good, I put this pair together right around Thanksgiving. And today's December 17th. We're having a, it's a, it's a nasty day. It's a cloudy day. Uh, rainy old cloudy day, but we've been gifted with having some warm weather, which we don't normally have. It's almost 65 degrees today, so hey, they can hear all the birds are talking to each other, they're cooing back and forth. And like I said, if you put your birds at that time together, you can see right now on December 17th, she's getting ready to lay her eggs. Uh, 18 days after this, she'll hatch them out. I'll be getting the bands issued to me sometime right around after Christmas, between Christmas and January 1st. You can do the math. You'll see when, by the time the babies are, uh, you know, eight, ten uh, days old, I'll be able to put bands on them that will stay on the legs good. And so it's going to work out. I'll have really good, probably some January hatches, early January hatches out of this pair right here. And because of their consistency that both of these birds had, uh, bloodline-wise, him actually flying and her full sister flying, I have a real good feeling that these birds are going to raise medium-sized birds and medium-small-sized birds that are going to be really good. What I feel like it's going to be good at long distance. This is a this is a killer pair, and I, I'll probably the babies, these first babies that come out of this pair, I'll send to a big race somewhere. I, I, I don't know just yet. I might send some more birds back to the Hoosier. I've been wanting to fly a couple of birds in the Gulf Coast Classic. I, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going to send them, but these will be high-quality racers. Uh, this is just one of the matings that I've got going on that I really think a lot about this year. Um, we'll go to this pair. I put this pair together, not so much for uh, sending babies this year. I wanted this blood real good. To me, she's the best looking silver hen that I've bred in the last 10 years. She's so classic Sion. She's got the Sion head, the, what I call the Robert Sion, not the Paul Sion. Robert Sion, and he does too. And I really wanted to bring some of that stamp, some of that solid Sion, good looking face and head on, on a lot more of my silvers. I wanted to get, I'm looking at building a family all the time, and I wanted to get this type a little more stronger going on. And, and I know between this bird and this particular pigeon, you can see there's a face there. It's the first thing you look at with raising pigeons that I'm going to be breeding back out of it. 
a blend of her and him together is going to give me that real strong stamp that I'm talking about, that classic, what I call the old classic Sion. When you see people who say, I know a Sion a mile away, they're talking about Sions like this. You can see, uh, I did have her with her son and I changed my mind. I didn't want to do that. I really went after top. Both of these birds are down out of a, uh, they line breed back onto a powder silver cock that was banded 300 uh, that had uh, pearl eyes and um, he flew 500 miles six times and 600 miles five times. One of the best long distance birds that I've ever had in my life. Uh, and I had him almost 20 years ago. And these birds had him uh, or line bred back to him, both of them. So I'm going right back onto him. And he was a beautiful powder silver cock, medium sized real. So you can see he's a, this particular bird up here. Come here. That's Fatty over there. I've always called her Fatty cause she's first one to the feed trough when I've got her in the main lawn. And she's very difficult to make, she's a hen. She's double blue banded, so that tells me she's out of 300. I've only got two or three birds left that are straight out of 300. And uh, uh, she's very often about mating. The last time I mated her, I had her two years with a cock and didn't like a lot of the babies, the types that got shot. I mean, they were nice babies, but I only raised really one, and it was last year, and I've kept him, that I fell in love with. Single tail feather, powder silver, perfect pigeon. And, uh, and I had him back with her so I would get 75% her blood. There's nothing wrong at all about inbreeding with pigeons or line breeding with pigeons. And some of the guys that are really uh, good racing pigeon guys, they know that. Uh, I don't know, there's, you shouldn't mix up uh, morality with, with bloodlines. Uh, I love this particular silver. Let's walk out here. He's uh, probably got, he's, he's probably, what have he done, big boy? He hit something on his chest, so he's got a little spot on it. But he's, he's built perfect, and she is too. Uh, here's this walk over here by the creek. You can see, I get water from this creek. You stay where you're at, Jeremy. I get water from this creek in the winter time. The water lines here are, are froze up. Uh, we don't have water lines, but where I get the water's froze, so I have to bust ice on this creek, and, uh, and I dip water out of it. You can see it's relatively clear. I think my birds build up a certain kind of a immunity drinking that kind of water for about four months out of the year. And... Uh, as much as I don't like it, it's, it's kind of the thing I do like too, you know. You learn to like the things you don't like. But he's a beautiful, beautiful silver cock. And I, and I hope to raise maybe four or five rounds out of that pair. This year. Like I said, she's very optional about mating. And it'll probably take a while. She's a hen that, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it's six weeks or something before she finally will give in and say, yeah, you're my mate. And, uh, you know, we're in love now. She's very... She's that kind of hen. She's real particular. Uh, but I, I'm putting him back to her really for type. In the blood, I'm line breeding back on 300. Uh, I'm gonna raise powder silvers out of them. That'll be have the light violet eyes, like he's got. That's not a light violet. That's just a good, solid, regular violet eye. You might wanna look at that. He's just like his uh, grandfather. His grandfather was 300 and her father was 300. Uh, so. That's how I'm going back on the 300 blood. Built perfect, medium-sized pigeon. She's a medium-sized pigeon. Um, like I said, I call her Fatty. That's one of my matings for 2022 that I highly value. Highly value. She's a fuss pot. She she does all. I don't have very many hens that that talk to me like she does it. Everything she's like, a, I don't know. She's always a little bit. That's the way she is in the loft all the time. That little, that's the way she's always been. But she's very tango in the loft. With just I'm, she's the first one that comes up to me when I get ready to, 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 to feed the birds. And when I feed them right now, when I've been feeding the two, she's the first one that goes over. She goes over and gets the food and won't let him have food until she's done eating. Let me catch her. I want you. Cause she's a, I've got, I've got several birds in the, in the loft that are down from her, straight out of her, that uh, if I was to lose her or she was to die or something, I've tried to keep this blood. She's a, uh, what I consider my most happiest and one of my best silver hens I've ever raised in my life. Like I said, she's down out of a bird that flew 500 miles six times and 600 miles five times. Uh, there's not too many of those birds around anymore. And you can see she's absolutely beautiful. You know, I'm trying to raise long distance pigeons. That's what I stress. 
birds that fly five and six and seven hundred miles, some of them a thousand miles. Uh, and and also beautiful. Not just not just long distance birds, but beautiful. And I, and I really don't believe anybody, any of the Trentons or anybody that really uh, is noted for 700 and 1,000 mile pigeons. I don't believe anybody's ever bred birds that I know of that are, <laughs> that are as beautiful as these Sions are, long distance. In nature, I'll talk a little bit about color. I'm gonna switch back and forth on the subject. But in nature, when you study birds, uh, particularly birds that migrate long distances, you'll find that the birds that fly the longest distances in nature are birds that are light colored. And the people who study uh, color and migrations and birds have, uh, have, uh, have reasoned that the reason that birds that fly thousands of miles to migrate back and forth, uh, why they are light colored is because birds can fly, they don't, uh, they don't hold as much heat while they're flying. As you know, if you wear a white t-shirt or a white sweater, uh, in the summertime, it reflects heat. If you have on black, it absorbs heat. So your darker pigeons, if they have to fly seven or 800 miles, uh, they're probably gonna absorb more heat if it's a warmer day. It's gonna be a little bit harder, harder on a pigeon than a light colored pigeon. At the same time, if you've got a light colored pigeon, again, with all these cooper hawks that are all over the entire United States and North America, that light colored pigeon's gonna stick out. So you've got two things to weigh there. You want that pigeon to be more attractive to a hawk or do you want it to have an advantage? And then there's a lot of discussion about the quality of the feathers itself. Usually the lighter colored feathers in like a silver tend to wear out a little more. They're not quite as strong as darker colored feathers. The, the thickness of the feather, the everything about that feather is uh, not quite as strong as the black jean. This is a red jean. You've got black jeans and red jeans with racing pigeons. Your silver bars and your red checks are red jeans, and your blue bars and black checks and blue checks, they're all black jeans. And that's what you're dealing back and forth with when you're mating pigeons all the time. The question comes up, how in the world, if people want to keep asking why all the time, and that's what you need to do to learn. You don't want to stop at somebody explaining something and just let it go at that. You want to continue to ask why, 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 and keep on going all the way back to why. And if you follow all those whys back, probably going to get into philosophy almost, almost get into a religion. And, um, and unfortunately, I've always asked a lot of whys. Why on earth could you take, if, if blue bars are the, are, the, are the pigeons that, the original pigeons, how in the world could you make two blue bars together that raise nothing but blue bars? How in the world could you do that? and actually come up somewhere down the line with a silver bar or a red. How in the world could you do that? And the answer is mutations. All throughout life, with plant, animal, anything that's alive, there'll be, that'll be that moment in breeding and something that, uh, that as, it, as it comes to life, there'll be that experiment within the blood, within that genetics uh, where it'll it's deviate a little bit. Right now we're still living with COVID and everybody across the world now knows all about COVID. Well, as you know, COVID is starting to mutate. We're having different mutations right now. You know, we've had two shots and the booster shot and now they're talking about coming up with something else with this new variation of COVID. That new variation is a mutation and that's exactly what I'm talking about. <clears throat> when you start to study evolution and start to study life on earth, and how we all came to be, no matter what it is, whether it's a tree or, or me or these pigeons, whatever it is, we came back from millions of years ago. We didn't happen overnight. And uh, we, we are what we are today, all of us, because of mutations. It's an experiment that life, there's a force within life that wants to reach out and try to see if we can't go this direction, uh, to see if, if we can't survive doing this little bit of mutation. It's a, it's, a, it's a life force drive of that particular entity. It's, a, it's crazy, it's a wild thing, but it's, a, it's also a beautiful thing. It shows the power of life itself and how much that um, life on earth wants to exist no matter what form it takes. And that's what mutations come back to. And, uh, and that's why 
at some point we had a mutation with the blue bars. They've, they've raised a, a bird that had white or they've raised a bird that had a little bit of red in it at some point through a mutation and then eventually you know the, the mutations uh, survived and those uh, they mated with each other and those mutations then all of a sudden took off just like the new COVID's doing right now. And uh, that's how I, we came up with these birds, these silver bars out of the blue bars. And that's how we came up with the red checks. It was through a series of mutations. Uh, I said it, uh, and I could get, I can go back more about how we, how those mutations came to be. Uh, but right now I'm talking about maybe, I'll get back more into color in a second. Uh, one of the things on, on blue bars and silver bars, there's such a thing as a powder blue bar and there's such a thing as a, uh, a powder silver bar. And people who like to show pigeons, that, uh, that's an important, uh, because an important factor in showing birds. And the, a powder blue bar or powder silver, you see this area on the neck, that's called a hackle. But when you've got a bird that doesn't have this color, there came a wren that was just trying to come in here. We have a wren here that comes to Kentucky called a winter wren. It actually migrates to Kentucky and, uh, and lives here only in the winter time. And in my book, my second book I wrote, The Fairies, I have a chapter called Winter Wren that performs a miracle. Uh, it fascinated me that a bird would come here, a little wren, to stay here in the winter time. Of course, wrens are uh, deceiving. A wren has a beautiful song to it. And uh, and you think of little cute little wrens, but wrens are they're very territorial. Once they stake out a spot, they'll go around. If there's any other birds that are nesting in there, they'll go in the they'll go and get in that bird's nest and break the eggs. Make sure there's no other competition in that area. Wrens wrens are, are vicious little creatures actually. But this was called a hackle on a bird. That's where that fluorescent color comes from. And I'm going to talk about why birds have this irid not fluorescent but iridescent. I didn't mean to say fluorescent iridescent. There's a reason why I talk, I'm going to talk about iridescence in pigeon colors, not only in pigeon colors, but iridescence in hummingbirds and iridescence in a lot of the birds like peacocks might have. There's a reason why those birds have those particular colors, uh, why, why iridescence exists in feathering. Uh, she's not a powder silver for the fact that she does have that color. A powder silver will come on down. You know, in shows, sometimes you'll see people talk about red bars. I see that term sometimes, like talking about rollers and stuff being a red bar roller. But in racing homers, generally the term is silver bar. And then if you, just a slang term that you use is silver. And so I call these birds silvers. It's a silver bar. And uh, again, she's not a super light colored silver. She's just a real, what you call a real nice colored silver. There are silvers that have gray in them, uh, that are uh, dull colored silvers. And if a silver has little splotches on the wing here, a lot of time we call them mealies, and I don't mean splotches, but little colorations, little also red colorations. Not dots like a check has, but just sort of, sort of what we call a mealy. So sometimes you'll have a silver mealy. She's a straight up silver. I only have one silver mealy right now, and I call her a strawberry, and I'll show her to you a little later on to show you what that particular color pattern is. And uh, she's a classic strawberry because uh, that color, I've had two or three friends in my lifetime that I highly respect that knew about color fairly well. They pushed color back so far in, in understanding it, some of them a little more than others. Clyde Galloway uh, loved to talk about color. And back in the 70s and stuff, in the 60s, he was well known up in New York and he wrote a book about colors on pigeons, a very small little brief book that you could call such a thing a book. Uh, and then, uh, uh, I also had a friend named Douglas McClary, which worked at Scotland Yard. He was a bodyguard with the uh, old Princess Diane. He moved to, he was one of the premier showmen in England. He used to come and live with me in, in Kentucky, brought his family over. Uh, his my loft uh, that I built in Kentucky, uh, in Ravenna, Kentucky. Uh, he had on the, uh, in his book, and, and he used, he did several stories about me in the pictorial. And uh, he moved to, uh, Australia and I have lost contact with Doug since then but Doug Doug was a fantastic person one of the nicest showmen you could ever meet a real gentleman and a good writer he's written several books now on pigeons and Doug was also a fanatic on color in fact Doug's favorite color for a long long time was powder blues and one of his best birds that he had was a blue bar that that had that no no color in the hackle it just 
the same color all down through the neck. Real, real light blue, the sky, sky blue. Uh, we didn't hardly have any of those birds that had that particular kind of blue, that light blue in the United States, except uh, uh, now you'll see a little bit of it. It's been introduced here and there. Um, and then the third person, I can't forget him. Uh, and he's still a very good friend of mine. We've been friends for 40 years and uh, I highly respect uh, him. One of the people who legitimately could beat me at a show. I enjoyed his friendship and his knowledge about pigeons and that's Jim Isselhart, who lived in Illinois most of his life. Uh, and now I knew Jim and his brother, his brother that got killed. And uh, uh, you, you couldn't find a more dedicated pigeon person than him that really st to, uh, studied birds uh, any, any more than Jim did. He was a color nut like, I, like I've been as well. And Jim knew the value of a blue bar or a brick red or a silver or whatever. And uh, uh, the first time that I met Jim, I was judging the National Young Bird Show at Louisville. And uh, he entered the show there, and I gave him best in show uh, for a black lace cock that he had. Uh, that was a beautiful pigeon, and I still love those black laces. He had a, it's a dark check, except that the pattern, it has a different pattern. It's, it's rows of checks. And he had the most gorgeous black uh, lace cock that I'd ever seen there. And we, we almost had immediate friendship. We're very much like, almost like brothers. And still, I call him, and he calls me at times, and, and uh, seems like we're, we just spoke to each other 30 seconds ago. We, that kind of friendship we've had. Um, anyways, I'll put her back up. Uh, I was going to talk more about the colors, uh, but they've talking. They they all understand colors to a point, but I don't think they've pushed color back to the point where they want to understand color to how color is on a feather, why it's like that. It's one thing to understand genetics about the recessive and dominance of colors. It's also another thing to know about colors, why why they are, are that color, not just because you made it a blue bar back to a blue bar. And like I was getting ready to say earlier, I'm trying, is that Clyde Galloway uh, talked to me about, he said, mating pigeons a lot of times for color is like mixing paints. And I said, well, there's some truth in that, and there is some truth in that. And geneticists understand that there is some truth in that, but it's a lot more complicated than just mixing two paints together. And I'll get into that in a little bit. But right now, again, I'm talking about just these two silvers that I've got made for 2022. Um, go back in here. Jeremy's filling, filming this again. He's my Cecil B. DeMille's. I'm really excited about this pair because I'm gonna. I already know. I already know they're gonna raise beautiful silvers. Um, I hope I can get a January silver out of them, but probably because she's so particular about how she mates, she probably is not gonna mate with him. I probably get, I'll be do well. Here it is, December seventeenth. I'll probably be lucky to get a February baby out of them. And I hate raising babies. And I'm not using any heat. I'm not using any lights. You know, uh, I talked about this the other day. That I don't know of anyone in the United States that was using a light system back in the mid '60s and early '60s. And I've said this several times. I was the first person. I wrote a series of articles in the Raising Pigeon Bulletin. Four of them that were on the front page, where I talked about the influence uh, and the importance of light and breeding uh, and and I learned that from uh, visiting racehorse uh, stables where they were using the lights and when I was a teenager seeing that they were using the lights and then getting the horses st stimulated to breed and I put two and two together and, and figured out that hey you can do that with pigeons the reason that birds don't raise babies in the winter time don't nest and have babies the birds that you see robins and cardinals sparrows, you know, crows, whatever the bird is. The reason that it's not because it gets cold. Temperature has nothing to do with it. It's the length of light. In the fall of the year, as the light becomes shorter, like here in Kentucky, the length of the daylight starts to grow less. Animals are not going to mate. And as, as uh, through the winter, you're not going to see birds, generally speaking, you're not going to see birds that are going to have eggs and be nesting. It didn't have anything to do with the temperature. But in the spring, as the daylight starts to get longer, then you see birds that are stimulated by that light, then they want to start mating again. And that's why you can use artificial light system to, you, to get birds to mate in the dead of winter. And they say you should leave lights on like 18 hours a day, you know, all through the winter time if you want them to, to breed. And that's true, but I like to leave them on 24 hours a day. And the brighter the lights, you know, the more stimulation they get, the more you're probably gonna see 
a lot of activity in mating. And it's not hard at all to raise babies in November, December, and January, and February if you're leaving strong lights on in the loft. And uh, again, it depends on what you want to do with birds. If you want to raise a lot of early hatches, then put them together around Thanksgiving, leave your lights on for about three months, and you're going to have a slew, or you're going to have, or whatever you want, of young birds. Okay, I'm going to go to another mating here. This mating is very similar to this other mating, although I'm using two different colors here. This bird I'm getting ready to come out here is called seagull. A seagull, come here, hot shot. Seagull is a little more different than a lot of my seagulls. I, I love this pigeon. Let me bring him out here. He's real light pearl eye. He's out of uh, Hardcore Junior and Little Chattanooga. He's out of Hardcore. He's out of Hardcore and Chattanooga. That's, that's I'm sorry, I take that back. So he's out of two 600 mile pigeons. Birds that flew 600 miles as young birds. In fact, Hardcore was the best 600 mile young bird that I've raised in the last 20 years. Came back early on the second day uh, in about 85, 90, almost 90 degree weather. Let him loose down in Florida and he was back here in Kentucky the next morning by himself. First bird back out of about 165 birds. Um, and he looks very much like uh, his daddy. He's not as pretty as a lot of the Sion's I've got. He doesn't have that real classic uh, wedge Sion head. He's more a little more snappy. Looks more like, a little more like a wild pigeon. But at the same time, the men who raise pigeons probably recognize this bird and say, you know, he looks more like a real great racing pigeon. Because a lot of times the birds that are great long distance racing pigeons, they're not always beautiful pigeons. They, they're more like this more times than not. You know, they're, they're all dead serious racing pigeons. And that's what this bird is. I love this bird because of his wing ratio. You can see the length of his body. You see his wings, even when I've got him in the loft. But when you see his wing, he's got a wing ratio compared to the rest of his body, when, especially when you pull out the other wing, that's uh, a, lot, a lot longer than, the, uh, than, than most of my birds in, in relationship to the rest of the body. And on long distance, if you've studied long distance birds, pelagic birds, gulls and terns and stuff that make that are the greatest flowers in the world you'll see that ratio of that they have a wing ratio to body is almost always longer that's why i named him seagull because of that wing ratio this bird has he has the best wing ratio i have out of 135 pigeons right now he has that beautiful eye that, that flies well almost all over the world anymore heisman didn't like this eye but i've tended to keep a lot more of this eye it flies very well the only other Sion man that I've known of any uh, reputation that had the bird Sions that looked like him, that had that eye, that looked was this type, was a professor down in uh, Georgia named Gil Renard. And Gil Renard was very well respected as a long distance racing pigeon man. And his Sions looked like these. This looked like a Gil Renard Sion. They didn't look like these other Sions I've got. Uh, and Gil's dead now and his birds are gone, that whole Sion family. As far as I know, it's totally dissipated. You know, it's vanished in the air. And, uh, and I guess that'll happen to me. You know, I'm pushing 71 years old. I'm hoping to keep this family together uh, for as long as I can and, uh, and put my stamp on it more than ever. Now, I've taken this bird who's down out of Hardcore in Chattanooga, two 600 miles, and he's a 500 miler himself. He flew back from 500 miles as a young bird. Very, very smart bird with this unusual bird, super tight vent, and the vent is back here where these two bones come together. And there's very little space between the keel bone and the vent bone. They're right together. You can't, my, my finger is laying on both of them. So he's got what they locked back, strong back, and he's got a strong back wing. That's this, this feathering back here where these coverts are at. And this bird is going back and talking about color again. You can see those little specks on the wing that I was talking about earlier, the little colors. And you could technically call him not a straight silver bar, you could call him a mealy, a silver mealy, because of those little bars. And he has that gray in his, mixed into his flights. You know, when you see a bird, a silver, that's got that gray in it like that, again, that goes back. If you don't know anything about it, pigeons at all, that's telling me that somewhere in this bird's line, lineage, and the genetic makeup of this bird, 
somewhere in this bird's line, he's got a blue bar, a black, you know, a black jean mixed in with that silver. It's coming out in there. That's mixing the paints, and that's why that bird has those colors like that. Yeah, this is a dream bird for long distance. This is the kind of bird, if I'm going to fly 700 miles or 1,000 miles, extreme long distance, this is exactly what you want. The lighter colored bird, not carrying any weight, and he's a perfectly built pigeon. Got great wings and great body makeup. That's exactly what you want for 600 mile race. This is the bird that I would see. I believe in giving birds a lot of rest, and I believe in these big races that they're having now, these big one loft races, they really don't give the birds enough rest. You know, if I was going to, I think the one loft races should, I think really the last race in the, in the Hoosier and the in African races and other major races, I think they should be 500 mile races for young birds. If you really want to find out who the champion pigeon is, take the young birds out to 500 miles. And that's not a distance that's impossible. I fly the young birds 500 miles. I was doing it every year. I haven't for the last couple of years for different reasons. But uh, for a long time as I was growing up in the 50s and the 60s, there was 500 mile young bird races all over the United States. It was a race that everybody looked forward to. But because we've imported so many birds over the last 25 years from Europe, uh, over the last 30 years that are really basically middle distance and short distance birds. They talked about flying 300 kilometers. Or bird did okay on 400 kilometers. You're talking about 200 miles and 300 miles. There's a huge difference between birds that fly 200 miles and birds that fly 600 miles. Uh, you get much, much better quality racing pigeon when you get out to 600 miles. Birds that are the best homing pigeons are the birds that have the best homing instincts. And the birds that have the best homing instincts are the birds that have can pick up on the magnetic fields on the Earth's surface better than the other birds. That's the number one thing that brings birds back, that there's a combination of things with that magnetic, being able to pick up on those magnetic fields is prime, it's key, and that's what a bird has to be good at, being able to, to sense where the magnetic fields are. Migratory birds do that, and so do racing pigeons. So I'm, getting, I'm gonna show you who I have got him mated to. I've got him mate, mated to a hen, that I absolutely love. I made it Hardcore Junior to Queen Strawberry. Hardcore Junior is out of uh, is out of Hardcore. It's the best bird that I bred out of Hardcore. Um, I've raised about 35 pigeons. He looks more like him. Uh, this bird has has his uh, Hardcore's blood in him. I mean, not blood, but the color. It's got that mealy color it carried over. And I made it, I'll show you who, who I raised out of Hardcore Junior and Queen Strawberry. Queen Strawberry flew 500 miles, Hardcore Junior flew 500 miles, and they're both down out of 600 miles. So I got four 600 milers as grandparents and two 500 milers, all of young birds as parents. So that's super long distance stuff. I'm going back two solid generations of six, six and 500 milers. Every bird throughout the pedigree has that. Here's this little hen out, down out of Hardcore Junior and Queen Strawberry. This pair is it's a bird I raised this year. This was the first bird I raised out of Queen Strawberry. I had Queen Strawberry. She was with a, a friend of mine. He had her and he couldn't get her to lay any eggs. He brought her back to me and uh, said she wouldn't lay. And she laid and, and started raising babies. The, within about three weeks after I had her. And uh, so I've been thrilled with the babies that I got out of them. Uh, she's down out of a red brick cock named Resolve that flew 600 miles and uh, Chattanooga, which was one of the best hens I've ever raised, a blue pencil hen. And here she is. Again, she's not a very pretty bird, snappy looking, you know, a little bit of squareness in her head. For look, you know, if you're showing a bird, this is not the bird you'd want to show, but oh my gosh. She's such a great pigeon to breed from. Again, she's got a little bit of that mealy going on, going back on hardcore. She's back, she breeds back onto him. This is a strong line breed breeding pair back onto my best 600 miler that I've raised. Beautifully built, tight vents, closed back, and the keel coming back up. Good full length keel, not too short, not too long, just right like a little baby bear wants. And uh, she's gonna be a great one with him. And again, I'm breeding those two pigeons together to raise birds that I think will be good at 600 miles and, and above. These are long distance birds. That's why she's double banded. 
you see I put a, she's got my KY band, but I also put my name and address band on her. She's a special pigeon. I knew that in the nest before she ever came out because of her bloodlines. And she turned out just exactly the way I wanted. And, and I've got her with the cockbird. They're gonna be wonderful babies out of that pair. I wish I could fly a 500 mile young bird race because that's what I'd want to enter. The only flaw I can see is that they're silver bars. And again, these Cooper Hawks are gonna jump on those silvers before they'll jump on the blue. Uh, that's the reason I've got this pair together. Uh, they've been together a little over a week and I'm still in no way believing that they're, uh, that they're a mated. She's, she's very hesitant. To, here she goes. See how, he's, see how he's knocking her off and talking bad to her? He's fussing with her right now. If they were mated, she'd come back up to him. You know, she's like, hey, cool down a little bit. We're in love here. But she's not. She's nervous around him still. Give him another week and that'll be a whole different attitude. You know, when he fly, when she flies back up there to him, uh, he's not going to fuss as much and she's not going to be as nervous around him. And I'll know they're mated then. Uh, that's just some of the things you look for when you, when you know a pair has finally taken together. This pair uh, was like this. But you can see it right here is classic. See how he flew up there? And he's a small cockbird. But see the difference? Do you, do, can you see the difference in how they reacted with each other when he flew up? It wasn't fussing and fighting. They know he, they're in love. They're a mated pair now. And when he flies up there, it's like, hey, honey, scoot over. I love you and you love me. There's uh, no sweats down here. And he's messing with me. See? See how the difference? They're a mated pair. And that's what a mated pair will act like. Uh, oh, I love this. I love this mating so much. This is a, they're gonna raise small birds, medium, small, and small pigeons. But for long distance, she has all of my best blood in her. You go back on third generation and you start looking at 16 birds that are in that third generation. Each one of those 16 birds is a 600 miler, five or 600 miler, every one of them, all of them great flyers. And she's a little small hen, quiet and everything. He is the same way, but lined up a little differently on the, when you go back to the third generation. And it just reeks with long distance. These are small pigeons. Again, this is a small cockbird, and she's a small hen, so I'm going to raise small birds. But people who are really smart racing pigeons, you know, a lot of times will tell you that on these uh, 600 milers, it's that small pigeon that you want. Uh, I know a lot, most of the really good long distance birds, a lot of times I've, I've seen come back to being small hens. I love this mating. Again, I hope that uh, I can raise some birds out of them. I think that they'll like pretty soon. And see, he's got the gray back that I was talking about earlier, like that we used to breed for, Jim Isselhart, mine, and some others. We would actually breed for that color back. I could, could care less when you're racing, but that's that blend. Instead of having a white back, it has that gray tone going through. Years ago, back in the 70s and 80s, and when Jim and I were showing against each other, we, we made sure we had those light gray backs all the way through, and all the toenails were black. In fact, if you had a bird that had one white toenail on it before the show, you might take a little magic marker and actually color that toenail, and then make it dirty so the judge would think that you've got all black toenails. It was cheating to some extent. Uh, Typical long distance bird. He's got all my best long distance blood in him. Kind of a henny looking cock bird. But oh, I got real good vibes on this pair right here. Single tail feather. A lot of guys believe in having a pigeon that's got the single tail feather. I'm, I'm not one of them, but hey, I don't, I don't fuss when I do get it. And uh, again, I, I stress a bird has the best homing instinct. Uh, and I like, like I was saying earlier before, I think that on these big races, I think the birds deserve a two or three week long full rest before they're taken out four or 500 miles to see which bird is best. Not fly them one week and then, you know, one week later they go out or, or three or four days later they go back out. I, I don't believe in that. They don't do it with race horses. You know, all the horses that are going into the Kentucky Derby, every one of them, that's why all your prep races, your bluegrass and your wood, uh, wood memorial and, and Arkansas Derby and, the, and, and all the right in the California, all the different races that are that are flown. I mean, that are, that are run for race horses. 
before the Kentucky Derby, which is considered the greatest race in, in horses in the world, still is today, right here in you know, my home state, they give those horses one month full rest. Uh, that's why they have all those major preps one month before the Derby. On that one month before the, the first Saturday in May, you'll, if you're watching television or, or living near a racetrack, you'll see that's when their big race time is. They want those horses to have that long rest. And I really believe that the pigeons need that long rest. Pigeons that are rested up are healthy and happy uh, versus a bird that is working hard all the time and stuff. That's good too. There's two schools of thought on that. I want the bird that's happy and healthy and, and well rested up and, and, and gets that one big time to come back. Uh, there he goes. I love this mate. Not a particularly beautiful pair and they're not showy at all, but oh my goodness. For long distance racing, again, that's what that's what the, the no sweat seons are noted for. They're doing well uh, in, in long distances. Classic, classic mating right here. I can't wait to this pair of lanes. I can't wait to see how the babies do. I know they'll do well. I got good vibrations about that pair. Let's, let's cut it off. Okay, it's uh, December 17th. Still, still shooting this video about color and, and some of my matings that I'm using. And now I'm in the loft. I call it, this winter I'm calling this the red loft. This is normally the young bird loft. I have uh, eight cock birds in here and 13 hens, all of them brick reds. Uh, I'll take it back, one of them just a regular red check. That's that bird there, and I call him Jim. I named him after Jim Isley, because uh, Jim liked him so well in some of the photographs that I sent. And I did too. Jim might see birds a lot of times alike, so that's Jim up there. And I got another bird here I call Chuck. That's more of a kind of red chick, and I named him off of a friend named Chuck Stenser. Um, that's a bird that I've, that I've liked over the last couple of years. And uh, well, I've got Chuck and Jim in here that are not brick reds, but all the rest of them are brick reds. And um, there's Chuck back over there. You'll see him over there. He's a little darker red than Jim is. But the rest of them are all brick reds. We call them brick reds, or I call them brick reds, and so a few do others, because of the simple fact that bricks, you know, are, are, a lot of them are darker red than this. They're brick colored reds, more like this brick is. That's a darker brick red. You all know what brick red is, or what a brick is. Uh, I've, got, I've put some nesting bows in here, and for breeding, I think there's two kinds of nesting materials that are best to use in breeding, and one of them is pine needles. And pine needles don't cost me anything. I've got anybody that knows me knows how much I'm, I'm a fanatic on trees, and I've got a big old uh, Scotch pine, probably the nicest giant Scotch pine you've ever seen in your life, growing uh, on my property. And uh, this time of the year, it sheds a lot of its needles and drops a lot of them out on the street, and I sweep them up and bag them up. But the great thing about a pine needle is, you know, they smell good. And the other thing is, the, the type of construction that a pine needle has, mites and bugs don't get down inside of them like they can in hay and, and, and other nesting materials that some people might want to use. You don't really want to use hay, you want to use something like a pine needle. The other thing that's even better than pine needles are ground up tobacco stalks. That tobacco, hey, if you're a smoker, you know, you're playing with, uh, you're playing with fire there because that tobacco a lot of times has chemicals on it. Because the people who raise tobacco have to have bugs to kill the bugs. So a lot of times you're you're actually smoking in some of that chemical spray. I think really be, tobacco wouldn't be as bad for you if it didn't have all the chemicals that are mixed in with the tobacco. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm right here in Kentucky and, and I've worked in tobacco fields and topped tobacco and cut tobacco and hung tobacco and booked tobacco and done everything you can do with tobacco. And tobacco's only been on its way out for a long time. And we've always thrown the tobacco stalks back out onto the fields, and I always thought, you know, those tobacco stalks are great. I, I even take some of the tobacco leaves that fall down out of the barn when we're drying and uh, sack them up. The farmers a lot of times don't want them if they're dirty and get dirt on them. But I would take those and crumble them up, put them in the nest bowls, and you boy, you won't see a bug. You won't see a lice or, 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 or any kind of louse, I mean, or or mites that get in the wings. You'll never see that if you put tobacco in the nest. So that, those bugs are scared of that tobacco. I mean, it, it kills them. They can't, they can't stand it. So that's your other good nesting material. Here's some of the brick reds. You know, this loft's kind of dark here on the inside, but you can see the color here. Uh, Jeremy, you can see these are classic brick reds, and these are all brick reds. And I only have birds from last year and this year. If they're red banded, that's this year's bird. And if they're, uh, 
blue banded, they're last year's birds. Most of my birds got killed by a mink last year. And these are birds down out of those 500 miles, and I'm trying to breed my reds back. So uh, I'm hoping this year with these eight pair of reds, uh, if I can raise it maybe three rounds each out of them and select the birds that I want, you know, I can build my reds back up to having, you know, 30, 35 reds again, which is what I normally like to have, uh, these dark brick reds. Um, there's a lot of people love the brick reds. Uh, I was, I showed it, uh, the biggest show that year, I forget what year it was, but uh, it was the year that I showed at the Southern Racing Pigeon Association show. And, uh, uh, at that particular year, that, that particular show had the most birds of any racing pigeon show in the United States in it. And, uh, and I was showing against a lot of good showmen there. Uh, Edna Shifrey's been one of them, a red-headed lady from Australia. Uh, uh, she had the Australian accent and also had the South Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina accent. And I won the show with a brick red hen and, uh, that I called Ambrosia. And she loved that bird. And, um, uh, She'd gotten a little mad at me over the couple of years because I, I showed at the SRPA show seven times and I won the SRPA show seven times and I also judged that show three times. And as far as the numbers of bird racing pigeons, good solid racing pigeons that went into any show in the United States, the SRPA show had the most of them. Uh, so I was real proud of that fact. But when I won that show that year with that red hen, I could see Edna was upset because I was kind of taking her fame away from her. And once they said that this bird was the best bird in the show, I took that little red hen and I gave it to Edna as a gift. And that was probably the best thing I ever did in my life. We struck up a really good friendship out of that. And uh, Edna became the, one of the best friends that I had in the, in the racing pigeon sport after that. Um, I called her a red check hen because she had red hair too. So I gave a red check hen to a, a red check. But uh, I noticed at the shows these red, these brick reds were fascinating to everybody. They loved them, and, and for a long time, I no one had any brick reds as nice as, as as the brick reds that I was able to to breed. Uh, and, and I believe today, right now, I don't believe there's anybody in the United States. I don't know if there's anybody in the world that's got long distance racing pigeons in these brick red colors. And a lot of these birds look like they have black eyes, but they're not black eyes, they're violet. They're a dark, they're a dark purple. Uh, that have violet eyes, various different eyes, but different, beautiful brick reds. And all you can tell they're all a family. I had one guy uh, in the last video that, that, that uh, Jeremy shot at me. He said, well, all those birds inbred, they all look like they're just the same. No, these birds all these birds have been selectively picked out out of, out of a lot of people that I've bred. And that's why they have this uniform type. But there are, most of them are kin, and oddly enough, a lot of them go back to a blue bar cock that was named Leroy. But most of these reds do go right back onto a, a, a red chick cock. It wasn't a red velvet, it was a dark red chick that Charles Heisman had called Old 51. And I'm going to talk about red colors in birds, and I'm going to talk about red colors in pigeons. And there's uh, some, different, uh, some different things that people need to know about the color red. Uh, and there's different kinds of reds. You'll see right up here, just, it, I'm gonna talk just briefly, but you see how this red here and that red over there, these two right here on top of these nest boxes, these roosted nest boxes. You see how the red continues to go all the way underneath their chest and up back toward the rump. Versus here's a, here's a red over here where the red coloring stops, you know, down just a little bit below the chest. Here's another red over here, that's Chuck up there, where the red kind of comes down just below his neck and here's a red check altogether where his red just like a normal red check doesn't come at all. Here's a red that stops off. If you get into breeding these reds and become fanatic at it, you probably want to start breeding these reds where they get really red down all the way through the color like that. You can see there's a red over there. And I do have a few in here. Some of the reds that come to mind over the years that were within a family were the Trentons. There were some uh, dark red Trentons in the family and dark red blacks, but these, these birds are so much more handsome than the Trentons ever were, uh, and uh, a different kind of pigeon altogether. But the Trentons were long distance birds, and these reds are also long distance birds. Uh, like I said, I, I'm, I'm, I am not forcing any of these matings in here. I just took the cock birds in with the hens. Uh, and I'm gonna let, because I don't think I can go wrong here, you can see they're all handled like dreams. Each and every one of these birds are perfect in the hand. And, uh, and they're all down out of 600 milers. And I don't care how they mate. Uh, there's some guys that'll do that. I'm not, I'm not forcing a mating in here whatsoever. 
I'm gonna let Jeremy, I've got brought a ladder in here. This loft's tall. These birds love this loft. They're very healthy in this loft. I've talked about this loft in other videos. So this is a this is the kind of loft you want. You can forget all about having to grab the pigeons all the time. I could care less about grabbing these pigeons. I'd much rather have them up here happy like this and healthy uh, where I can't get them. They feel safe up there. That's fine. And uh, uh, I don't need to be picking these pigeons up and grabbing them like some little kids got a, a toy all the time. Uh, these birds are very tame. Uh, environment does play a little bit of role on on the uh, on how a, a, a creature is, whether it's wild or tame. You know, whether you've got a large loft or a small loft, how how does that have a, uh, an effect up on that uh, particular individual? But tame birds are going to be tame whether I've got a big giant loft or I've got a little bitty loft. It, uh, it's uh, it part of their genetic makeup, and I've, I have selectively bred over the years to keep tame pigeons. I don't have birds that are butting against the walls and flying against Avery's. So anybody that tells you you've got to have a little bitty loft in order to have tame pigeons is, doesn't know what he's talking about. You can, uh, as an example, I can take cattle. Uh, people who raise cattle want tame cows. They keep their weight on them. And you can take a cow that's wild acting, and, and farmers that raise cattle, farmer, they know what a wild cow is, and they don't want wild cattle. You can take that wild cow and put it on a quarter acre lot, and that, that cow's gonna stay wild all the time. It's never gonna tame down, it's gonna be a wild cow. And I can take a tame cow and put it out on a 500 acre field, and it's gonna be tame. So, and it's gonna stay tame, and more likely it's gonna raise tame babies. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to explain to you that wildness factor isn't had to do about the sizes of loft. And so anybody tells me that I've got a loft up here that I can't reach these birds that's going to make them wild really doesn't know what he's talking about. These are very tame pigeons. Uh, but I want to get talking about uh, the color red. And I want Jeremy, I want to get a ladder here and, I, and keep him panning while I'm trying to talk about red. Um, Red's a very interesting color. You don't see very many of these dark brick reds within racing pigeons. You'll see them every now and then, but you don't see the quality of these birds like this and consistency of the red that these birds have like this. Uh, uh, red, red in nature is a color that all birds pay great attention to. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the birds that's the most noted bird throughout North America and the United States, it's one of the most noted state birds. It's a Kentucky state bird. And it's a state bird, I don't know, in 15 or 20 states and throughout the United States, is the cardinal. And everybody knows what a cardinal is. It's a beautiful, brilliant red bird, the, the male is, and the female, you know, she has different uh, colors of tan and sort of olive, sort of uh, different shades of color in her. She's not that brilliant red. A lot of people don't realize this, but uh, pigeons are either born with, uh, birds that are red, are either born with that, and this is only, this is only, you know, come up in the last several years of, of, of biologists and just people who study the, the color red within birds. Some birds are born red colored uh, genetically, but most birds uh, are uh, get that red coloring through the diet that they eat. If you catch a cardinal and keep it in a cage and, uh, and do not feed it the seeds that a wild cardinal will normally eat, one of the seeds they like to eat are the, the small seeds off of a dogwood tree. And if anybody knows anything about dogwood trees, those little bitty seeds are bright red. And there are other seeds that cardinals pick out to eat. That seed, a lot of times it can be a seed that's even a sort of a yellow seed. But that seed is digested in that bird and its liver will produce chemicals that help make that bird red. And in nature, red, there's an old saying with birds, redder is better. And I almost believe it's true with raising things, which is a whole different ball game. But uh, that's the reason, what I was gonna tell you is if you leave a cardinal in a locked up in a cage and you feed it a diet of seeds and keep the bird healthy, but you can, you can keep the cardinals in cages. Uh, and it goes through two or three different molts, say a third molt, you're gonna find a cardinal that's not red anymore. You'll lose that color. And a lot of, so you start to learn, hey, cardinals get their color by the type of diet that they eat. And uh, they eat certain seeds that actually help produce the red. People know that about uh, certain different other birds, but they don't realize that like the goldfinch, the yellow goldfinch, it gets its yellow because of its diet that it eats. Um, I'm gonna talk, 
I want to catch a couple of these birds and talk about them, but I'm also going to talk a little more. And then I want Jeremy to get up where he can keep these birds, where he can film them while I'm talking. I want him to get up closer to these. I want to show you one thing that I did this year. I didn't buy those nest bowls that are six dollars each or ten dollars each. The clay nest bowls, the the paper mache nest bowls, and all that other stuff nest bowls. I, I got three pine needles. Then I went to a dollar store, dollar dollar something here, and I bought these dog bowls, these little plastic dog bowls, and I gave a dollar each for them. I think I bought sixty-five of them, maybe seventy. And that's what I'm using. They actually fit really good in these tight spaces. I wedged them in. And these I put a couple of bricks around to keep them down. But they serve perfect for pigeons nesting. You don't have to spend, people spend too much money wanting their loss to be beautiful, wanting those perfect nest bowls, perfect waters. You can see right here's three different examples of water. And uh, a lot of the birds like this water here. Uh, I like this one right here, but it can be a pain in the, and you know what, when you have to change the water in it, because you have to line up your slots. This slot's got to come up and down that. And sometimes you get, and if you've got a water like this, you've got to put a, I put a milk crate with the wood top on it. That's so that the water won't get dirty. Pigeons that hop up here, they can't mess in it in any ways. Yeah, then this, this protects that. Um, so you've got three different waters here that are using. And it's funny, some loft, some of the birds will prefer to drink out of the green one. And in this particular loft, for whatever reason, they like drinking out of that, that, that particular tin. The water will go down in that first before I, uh, before any of the other waters do. And I'll notice that in other law say they'll, they'll like one particular water. But birds do like this green uh, pretty good. And I prefer that green over the plastic ones. It's more durable when it comes winter time. It won't freeze and break like so many others do. Okay, I've asked uh, Jeremy to get up on a ladder where he's a little more level with these all these brick reds uh, that I have. Let me try to scoot some more of these over the you know, since you're getting a really good this is probably the greatest group of, of Rick Reds, I would say, in North America. Get over here. Come on. Say over here, hot Well, like I said, I want to talk about, I'm not talking about the matings right here so much. I want to talk about the red color. You know, in the bird world, uh, the color red really has a special significance. Uh, many of the species, many of the different kinds of birds you have, and I think we have in the world, I don't want to be too wrong, but I think there's 9,000 species of birds. Um, many of the species that use those red signals uh, a lot of times to uh, to scare off other birds. Some birds, they, they see that red, and like I said, redder is better for different reasons. Um, the reds have two different Birds have two different basic sources of colors, what I want to talk about. Uh, and I'm talking now more in nature than just isolating talking about pigeons. The more common uh, of those things is called pigments. And which is a, a pigments are a chemical compound uh, <clears throat> that's located in the feathers or in the skin of a bird. And you all know what pigments are. You talk about painting and you, and you talk about the pigments in paint. Pigments, they're absorbed and, and they reflect, um, they reflect paint uh, colors. It, it, it's this reflection of light that we see all coming off of these pigeons uh, that reaches our eyes. That's what our eyes see. Our, and the color we perceive uh, is actually a function of the of the wavelength of that light that's stimulating the receptors in our eyes. And the, uh, the, lo the longest wavelength of these colors is red. And, uh, and, and no light, if, if there's nothing, no, none of those light uh, colors in that light waves are being reflected, you have black. And if all light is being reflected back, you'll have solid white. Um, I, I, the, the, I want to talk earlier, I talked to you about iridescent colors. Iridescent colors are produced uh, by the different reflection of those wavelengths that I'm talking about. From the highly modified, what they call barbules on the, on the wings, 
uh, the feathers in in the uh, in, uh, the barbules in the in the feathers that you all over the all over the bird, particularly in their wings, um, they're they're rotated so that uh, the flat surface uh, faces the incoming light. It's the best way I can explain it. Just as the birds, um, just as birds, I'll say this: just as birds did not evolve to please our eyes. That also the songs of wild birds did not evolve to please our ears. So there's reasons behind why we have this red uh, going on. Um, it basically boils down, I want to say, to two different pigments that decide what the color of a bird will be. Uh, there's the the melanins and the the the, the um, carotenoids, and uh, uh, melanins create a range of uh, of colors between black and gray and brown and orange, and the carotenoids carotenoids um, on the other hand they create are called brighter colors. Uh, they range uh, naturally in birds. Uh, and, it, and that depends on the food that they eat. The pigments produce uh, a lot of different colors in nature like paint and also in dye. Pigments are the chemicals that are absorbed some of the wavelengths of light and reflect others. The absorbed color disappears and the reflected color is what we see. Pigments reflect red light and absorb all the non-red wavelengths Cardinals eat a lot of different seeds, like I talked about, and uh, that produce those uh, that red color. We, if you took the feathers of a red bird and ground them up, if you ground them up, the feathers are going to turn out to look sort of like black. And the reason that you're getting that, that color like it, like I'm talking about is because of the way that light comes down on those feathers and is reflected. And certain kinds of feathers reflect light differently because of the surface, hitting the, the light rays hitting that surface. There is no such thing as the color blue in pigeons. When I get to talk about blue bars here a little later on, blue is totally dependent. If you ground up, if you ground up blue feathers, I think you'll get black. But blue, I mean, you'll get blue ashes later. I think blue is that particular color that we see like in indigo bunnings and bluebirds and in blue jays, and a little bit with our pigeons themselves. Of course, they got a little sharper, uh, a more keen blue, more uh, iridescent blue. What happens in that blue color is because of the feathers on that bird. They don't have a flat surface like you think that's reflecting that light back. The kind of surface they have on those feathers actually has a certain uh, pattern to it that when the light hits it, it reflects back to our eyes that blue color. That's what we see. But the feather itself's not blue. We're seeing a, a, a sort of a magical game going on with the light, the, with the light, the way it shines down on a particular surface. So you don't have blue birds, and you don't have blue jays, and, and you, I'm not sure what you would say about pigeons, but I think with the pigeons, like I say, there's there's the pigeons that the birds that have their colors, a great many of them get those colors because of their diet, and, uh, and then there are recent studies that are showing some pigeons, birds are born with genetically are those colors. With the reds, what I've tried to do is make reds to reds to get a lot of these reds, which, you know, doesn't take a genius to figure that out. But if you want to make these reds darker, 
and Jim Isselhart and I've talked about this, and, and I've talked about it with other people that are uh, paying attention to, to breeding reds. Of course, the red looks really good when he gets darker red. He's got all black toenails, and he's got a black beak. It's, it sticks out. You know, it's a beautiful pigeon, an unusual pigeon when you go to a pigeon show or you're just looking at pigeons in general. And to get that really dark red, you can make two dark reds together, and you may raise a red that's even redder than either one of the parents. Probably if you raise the baby six babies out of that pair, you get one that will probably be darker than either one of the parents. And if that's what you're after, you keep that one bird. But if you really, uh, another route that you can take with the reds is to mate them back onto a really a, a black check or a black velvet, a blacker colored pigeon, make that bird to that red. And when you mate that bird to that red, let me stay, you stay where you're at. Bird to that black, there you go. You're mating the red color, just like you had a, a can of dark red paint that you bought at some paint store, and you take that black paint and you mix those two together. Well, what are you going to get? You're going to get darker red. Or you, you know, that, and that's what you're doing when you made a black to the red. And so I don't have any blacks in here, but if I was going to try to make these reds any redder, uh, darker red, that's what I would put. I'd put a really dark black velvet in here. I want to talk about this with the pigeons. Since the red is a dominant gene, and uh, and, the, and this pattern, you've got check pattern, you've got velvet pattern, you've got lace patterns, you've got bar patterns, you've got ash patterns, you've got grizzle patterns, you, you know, you've got all those different patterns, and those patterns are all dominant and recessive to each other. And one of the more dominant patterns that you can have over all the other colors when you're just talking about patterns is the velvet pattern. That velvet pattern will be strong. And the check patterns, both of those patterns are dominant over a bar pattern. If I made that check pattern, like that bird is, back onto a blue bar, uh, and all through their background is all evenly, you know, I've got half of them are checks and half of them are bars. When you go back four or five generations, you know, you've got 60 birds there and 30 of them are blue bars and 30 of them are checks. You're probably going to raise more checks because it's a dominant factor. You're probably going to raise more chicks than you will uh, bars in the babies. Uh, one, of the, one of the good things, uh, so you know that when you mate two, but but with when you mate these birds like that, like that red chick there, if I make two red chicks together, unlike having blue bars, I can raise about any color under the rainbow out of two red chicks. If I make that red chick back onto that red right there, that hen, those two birds right there can have a black pigeon raised out of them. That'll be theirs. They can have a blue check that come out of them. They can have a blue bar come out of them. But if they raise a blue bar or a black check uh, or a blue check, it will be 100% all the time. It will always be a hen. That's a color sex link opposite law that's always true with pigeons. When you make two reds together and they raise a black gene pigeon, it will always be a hen 100% of the time. This same pair can also raise you a silver bar. It can raise you a brick red, a light red chick. They might even throw a real white red chick, and they can raise birds that's got white on them. They could raise an albino. They can raise about any color under the sun, two reds can. Um, that's because of who they are. Two red chicks, that, you know, they're dominant. Color pattern depends on what's going on in their background, who their parents were and who their grandparents were as to what they'll eventually throw. Uh, I have found by mating four generations on about the fourth or fifth, fourth or fifth generation, where every one of them are all reds mated back together. I don't normally keep those birds. I try to fly them. This can, this law, it's kind of hard to see the colors. I want Jeremy to. There's a few hens that's flown out here in the Avery, in, in this one Avery, but you can kind of see the the dark red coloring on them. And you'll see one of them. Some of them are a little more what I call velvet pattern, and you'll see. You'll see some, most of these birds are really super dark red checks. Because when you can see, here, let's go right there. And you can actually see uh, a check in them. Like this bird has, that, you can see the check pattern in it. Whereas this bird beside of it is, on, is a little more of a red velvet. It's still got a check, but most of these birds are really, really dark red checks instead of what I call red velvets. And that's, that's going back on over 51. Any time that uh, uh, now all the blue banded birds are last year's birds, all the red banded birds in here. I only kept two red cocks this year. Uh, 
and that's that's this red cock right here. He had he handles like a brick. I mean, he's solid as he's solid as a rock. And uh, I know he'll be a good a good bird to breed out. That black you know, dark eyes. You know, one of the things that really sets off a brick red uh, is that light colored head. And again, if you want to try to raise some of the light colored heads, you know, I could make those birds back onto a little lighter colored bird, a light red check. Or, or I could bait it back to a blue bar even and get some of that of that lighter colored bird. Uh, one of the things about red I'll talk about too, I don't want to be repetitious, is that if you made a red cock bird to a, a blue bar or a black check or a blue check hen, in other words, a black gene hen, always, if the birds are the same color as the mother, as the, as the black gene hen, they'll always be a cock. And if the birds are the same color as the father, they'll always be a hen. It's called the color sex link opposite law. And that always holds true. Uh, a few years ago, I let some birds go a thousand miles and got uh, one of the birds that came back was band in 110. And that bird had was a blue check on one side of it and a red check on the other. And I never really was quite sure it was a, kid, a hot cock or a hen for a long time, but it turned out to be a hen. Uh, and, and you'll get that every now and that's, that's a very rare color to get. Uh, that's a real late hatch, this little hen over here, this little black eyed red hen. She won't be old enough to mate until probably March or April this coming year. But she's going to be a beautiful bird. She's going to be a dark eyed red velvet hen, you know, what I'm looking for. Uh, I'm trying to think of what else that I could talk about on reds. Um, some of these birds, uh, not many of them are really what I'd call showy. They're little. They're all classic Sion's. You know, Sion has a, you know, and they're really more my family. I'm get, we're getting ready to leave here. Oh, yeah. Well, I wanted to talk, you know, in the last video I talked about, let me hear this one. Uh, we talked about uh, breeders, and now I've actually got what I'm called matings. I'm gonna come up here a little bit. These are the birds that I'm actually mating. They're, these are not just, you know, I'm talking about breeders, but I'm also talking about mating. And I haven't, like I said, these are the birds that I will be mating from this year in 2022. And this will be the core of the birds that, uh, that will that I'll be raising that'll be reds, and I hope to be flying some of these young birds out of these birds 500 miles later on in October, possibly in November of 2022. These are birds that are basically line bred down out of old 51, very tame brick reds, all Sions. We can't get more Sions than these birds. Reds a color that's associated with Sions has been ever since Paul Sion. Uh, created the family and that family has been in existence now going on about 100 years which makes it one of the oldest families of racing pigeons in existence um, and this is a true old family I'm old school with these pigeons and uh, and I believe in, in holding on to a family maintaining a family and selectively breeding from year to year and keeping the highest quality that you possibly can in that family uh, any birds that are not perfect, they're not here. Not only physically, but genetically, you know, their backgrounds, they've all got to have, you know, solid three and four generations of 600 mile babies uh, of parents, you know, which makes this an extremely special, special group of pigeons to be this beautiful and to also be superior to long distance racers. You know, if I had the lights on in the loft right now, there'd be a whole lot more activity going on as far as 
birds wanting to mate with each other. I'm not pushing these birds at all. And again, you can see how I've, I've got the nest bowls, these dog bowls set up with pine needles in them. That's what they'll be going to. Well, I don't know if I've helped you, helped anyone talk on the subject of reds. Uh, it's one of my favorite subjects. Um, I have a lot of people that email me and call me and love to talk about the reds. Again, like I said, every now and then, uh, if I go three or four generations deep, wherever reds are made, I get recessive reds. And then on those recessive reds, I get a huge variation. Some of the reds are almost an orangish red. Some of them are sort of a purplish red. I get reds that have polka dots on them, on, on their colors with white splotches. Uh, but I, I don't like keeping those kind of reds. And I usually have them out here flying, and usually the hawks will get to them. Um, or really right now I just wanted to, I wanted to work with the dark reds and uh, hold on I'm gonna scoot this ladder over and try to get a little closer and then I'm gonna leave this log for a minute and go on to some of the others Jeremy Field stand over there behind me back there will probably keep them corralled here for a minute if I can get them I want the people who are looking at this video to see these birds Birds speak for themselves as far as, I believe, as far as quality. You know, I see a lot of pigeon videos, and uh, I don't see anybody that's got birds like this. my biggest strongest red I've got. And he's got that beautiful face. And they, uh, a, lot of, a lot of them say it's a powder head uh, because of that light, that light colored face. That's so classic Sion. And he is a classic Sion. Shut this off and let's go to another loft. Well, I didn't catch any of the birds long ago. I just realized it, so I caught one of them. And I caught Jimmy at the loft. I caught him because Jeremy didn't even know my birds that well. He said, well, that one red up there you called Jim, he's an alpha male. And I said, he is that. He's been that way ever since he came out of the nest. He's a big, strong red, and I like to get a lot of my brick reds more like him. I want to talk about this bird. Because he has that classic Sion face. It's got more of a kind of a chestnut eye. It's got to be have a great big a green with a green inner circle. A lot of guys are crazy about that green circle around the pupil. So it's a chestnut with a green circle, which, oh my goodness, there's a lot of people just fall over backwards for that kind of eye, but I'm not an eye sign person. It lays in your hand like a dream, this pigeon does. I wanted to show you something about Jim here. Is that he's got, see the black in him, that black flecking in the, in the feathers? You can see it. I don't have it in as many of my reds as, as, as Heisman did. And there's a reason I don't, I make my reds to reds and most of my reds don't carry a lot of black in them because I, I keep the reds separate. But Heisman was big on mating a red chick to a, a black chick or, uh, or a black gene bird because he had a lot of people that wanted to buy pigeons off of him. They wanted one pair or two pairs and they wanted to make sure when they bought the birds that they got two hens or two cock birds. And the way he could ensure that as a baby pigeons was to mate a red, uh, a red gene, a, a, blue, a black gene male to a red gene female. So he knew that all the babies, if they were the color of the male, they would always be hens. And if they were the color of the mother, they would always be males. He knew that coming out of the nest. 
It was like one of the very first things that Heisman taught me that when I was seven, eight years old. Started teaching me about the colors. And here, you can see it a little stronger in this. I wanted to talk about this black in this bird for a reason. Um, because anytime you've got a red check and it's got black in it like that, those black flecks, anytime you've got a red check that's got black on him, be up here, be anywhere on him, it's always a male. Always a male. If it's red and got black on him, it's always a male. Some people need to learn about pigeons if they don't know that much about birds. And if it's gray, or generally like a tan color more than often, or a tannish gray, it's going to be a female. If it's black, like this is, then it's definitely a male. And the thing about uh, most of these birds that have this black flecking is that you see what this bird is. This bird's not a year old yet. But when he's got this color now, like this, next year after he goes through his moat, that black on him is going to get a little more. It's going to grow a little more stronger. He's going to have it a little more through his body. And when he's about five years old, he's going to have a lot of black on him. I'll pull this wing out five years from now, and you're going to see a whole lot of black in that wing. You'll see a lot more black in the tail. And stuff. That black will will multiply. It won't, not at a, at a particular ratio, but it will be, it'll, he'll definitely have more black in him when he gets four and five years old. A whole lot more than what he's got now. There's a lot of old diehard Sion guys, particularly Heisman Sion's guys. They say, you got any of them red chicks that's got that black in them? I say, no, I don't have too many of them. I've got a few. Or silvers. The silvers also have that black in them sometimes. And, uh, one of the things that I've noticed here, you'll see on my jacket, it's turning white. This is a, almost a brand new jacket. And, and the reason it's white, all of a sudden, because I've been picking up just a few birds and this time of the year, you always want your birds to have a really good tight feathering in the winter time, you know, been through their molt. And that's the bloom, that's, their, that's that pigeon dust coming off of them. That just shows you're picking up a lot of nice, healthy pigeons, that's all. You want pigeons to have good bloom on them. It just shows you've got good birds, you know, good, healthy birds. Happy birds are healthy birds. And I say that over and over and over again. This bird here is full of himself. You know, every bird's got a lot of character. Like, like uh, Jeremy noticed, he's a, uh, he rules the roost in there. He's, you know, for a young cock bird, um, he can whip any pigeon in there. He's probably the biggest, strongest red I have out of all the reds that I do have. I'm real anxious to be breeding some reds back down out here in some creek reds. Every bird I've got in here, are all blue bars. They're all what I call my Leroy family. Uh, these birds have all been flying either in the Hoosier or the African races and uh, they're all kin. A lot of them are you know first cousins or half brothers and you'll see the you'll see a real distinct family of birds if I can get them all walking around here in Avery. Now, this Avery the other day had a cooper hawk that flew down and actually caught a bird through the Avery and killed a really beautiful Young cock bird, one of, the, one of the best birds I raised this year, made me look sick. Come on. Come on. Uh, I've got one pair that's it's got it's la already laid on, it's got eggs. Come on. Come on. Oh, what, now I talked about these birds earlier uh, in the last video that come on. Come on. There you go. There you go. Come on. Again I put those dog nests, uh, dog bows for nest down here. I've got them right up to the uh, I think 60 birds in this uh, in this log. All blue bars. There's one red check, young red check here. Uh, that, that's a real, real super late hat. Uh, let me have it for a minute. I want to, you know, we've got them kind of corralled up here in a tight space. I really, whoop. What I want to emphasize here before I get into talking about blue bar colors, I want to talk about family. I don't know where you're going to find a family of Sions that even come close to looking like these, this group of birds. These birds all handle like dreams. They're uh, tight vented, closed back, got good balances. Uh, all of them are down out of long distance pigeons. There's a variation in the eyes. Uh, 
most of the birds are probably there's a good percentage of young birds in here this year i had a race some gorgeous ones all the red banded birds are red are red banded i have uh probably probably 90 percent of the birds in this loft right here are five years old or less don't have that many five-year-olds in here there's five-year-olds and four-year-olds a few three-year-olds two-year-olds but these are not birds that are 10 years old 12 years old 11 years all that kind of stuff the oldest bird I have right now is over in another loft, and he's going on 13. Okay, I'm going to talk at length about blue bars. I'm trying to keep this video, it's, it's getting longer than I wanted to, but I wanted to talk about uh, colors and about some of the matings out here. You'll see right over there, I've got, they see all the birds look up just then, they, they had a crow up there. These birds are constantly under Cooper hawk attacks. Uh, out here in this Avery, they come, the, the hawks, in, a lot of times they'll fly down and hit in this Avery while I'm out here. One of the things that I'm trying my best to do is, because I don't think there's anybody else in the United States that's got an old family of, of pigeons like this. These are Sions that go back 100 years, straight pure Sions. I, I don't think Paul Sion, or Robert Sion, or Charles Heitzman, or any of these famous Sion breeders ever had a family that looked this good. A true family, a solid, family you just got through seeing the reds now you're seeing the blue bars and again when I make these blue bars with each other 99% of these birds are going to be blue bars I'll probably get a few what you call pencil blue bars I may get some blue bars that's got a little bit of white on them I've just about bred the white I don't get very many birds that breed white anymore uh, but I will get a bird that has to be a blue bar white flight every now and then and, uh, and I'll get a bird that might have a little bit of a, what we call a tick eye, one or two white feathers behind the, the corner of their eye. Uh, or, or I may get a bird or two that's got, you know, pencil marks on it. But 95% of these birds, when they're mated this year, they're gonna raise blue bars. Come back up. There's one of the older birds, I love him. He's a classic Sion with a little bit heavier waddle, you can tell you know, as they develop. Uh, there's one or two late hatch blue bars in here. Okay. Just in general, speaking about blue bars, you know, when you're mating them, you know, if you were breeding them for show back in the old days, uh, we tried to breed birds that had two wide bars, two those two black markings on them. Really two, the wider the bar, the better. And it's really hard to breed birds with wide bars. I almost see them more in, in birds that are actually racing than I saw them in show birds. And I still don't see that many. I went to the National Young Bird Show this year and I didn't see blue bars with big wide bars on their wings. What I saw were narrow bars and nothing generally as, as nice as the bars are here. Um, and, and one of the ways you could improve that bar, if you're just, a, just talking strictly about color, nothing else, uh, would, would make would, to, to put that bird back with a bird that has a check pattern and uh, Sometimes you're able to get that bar to widen if you're if you're trying to get wider bars on a bird oh, What happened is it wanting to rain it is raining And we're starting to get a little rain which yeah May interrupt shooting this video out here. We have to come back to the law. But I wanted to show family. You'll, you'll notice that the faces on these birds are very similar. Birds are very, very tame. Jeremy and I've got them bunched up together. You don't see them trying to knock each other out. I mean, they're, they're doing a little bit. But is this going to hurt your camera if it gets wet? I don't know. That bird right there is out of a bird called Lurch. Lurch and uh, Little Chattanooga, this bird right here. He's a late hatch. Lurch was a big, huge cock bird, biggest pigeon I've raised in a long time. And Little Chattanooga is a, one of the smaller hens that I've raised. And uh, a lot of times, if you made a big giant cock bird to a little hen, you're gonna get giant cock birds and, and little birds. 
But with that particular pair, I was thrilled to death because it turned out again just right. You've got a big pigeon uh, with a little pigeon, and the birds that came out of them were medium-sized perfect pigeons. This bird right here, again, is a bird that's a full brother in the summertime. The bird that flew so well for me in, Af in South Africa. And he's gorgeous. He's probably my favorite blue cock as far as type and looks and everything. And uh, I'm line breeding back uh, to several birds with him that, that, that are crucial, good all around flowers. I'm not breeding uh, birds to show. I don't show birds anymore. don't have any interest in it. But uh, I do like a, a beautiful pigeon. I do pay attention to what kind of faces they have. I'm trying to find a face that, that pleases me, a wedge-shaped face. Um, it sort of uh, shows me that a certain amount of intelligence in them. Uh, it's a certain type that I like. I don't like uh, the, the snappy-looking pigeons. Uh, so... I have the luxury that not only do I have the quality of long distance birds, but I can also go through and pick out what type of long distance bird that I have for them. And right now, uh, a lot of these birds that I've put back together are going to be mated right back onto the same birds that were mated last year. Uh, and then I've got some new matings that I'm experimenting with. And some, uh, some of the birds, I'm just going to let them mate any way they want to mate. Uh, so. But these are all breeders for this year, except for these few late hatches that are in here. And you can you can see what the matings are going to be like. That's Elvis right there, that big old heavy cock right there. He's not heavy, he looks heavy. He's, just, he's got a lot of, he's actually, feel, in his hand he feels like cotton. But he's kind of got, he looks, he looks big. He's got that sort of uh, dominant look in his face. That's 74 right beside of him. She's out of 33, the 700 mile hen, and that hen, that hen right there, 74, flew 500 miles as a young bird herself. Uh, and a gorgeous hen, very type, very much the type of pigeon that I breed for. She, uh, she actually flew better flying back from 500 miles than she did when I was training her. Uh, a couple of times she set out two days to come back from uh, 200 miles and stuff, but when I flew her 500 miles, uh, that was one of the years I got day birds. I had a good tailwind, but she came back on the day as a young bird from five, from uh, Florida, down in Jennings, Florida, uh, about about 30 miles, 25 miles down into the line. I'm going to move out of the way. I'm, I've got them a little bit too bunched up here. This many birds. Again, there's that bird that I love so much right here. I, very much my type of bird. What's this bird? I'll pick up a couple of birds. I want to talk about a few different things, and then we'll get out of this loft too. Uh, and then all we got is shoot. Well, we're not. I'm not going to stay in this loft. So this is a big handful of birds here. I want to talk about him. Uh, very much my type. He's one of the birds that I bred from last year. Classic scent. I need to. I'm not getting much light here. Show his eye and everything. He's a handful of pigeons. I got the birds fat right now. I've been feeding them too much. But I'd rather have them fat going into the breeding season, even though it sometimes can affect, particularly show birds, it can affect birds on the, you know, the and for the lake or not. Uh, when you raise show birds, you get a little bit too much fat going on back up in here, and they have trouble making contact in order to uh, do the for the legs. Now we've got a strong rain coming down on us now, because that rain wasn't supposed to hit us today, I don't believe. But we've had, what, three days of rain now. I want to show the eye on this bird. He's got a little, a little different eye than I keep a lot of them. More that really classic violet eye. I love this pigeon. He's uh, down out of hardcore and long -way. Don't have many birds left out of hardcore and long -way. That's where he gets that eye, he's off the of hardcore. And uh, they get raised. And he's got this single tail, tight dance, the whole nine yards. Uh, two 600 milers is his parents. He's got a lot of personality. 
And he was he was one of the best birds that ever came out of that pair. I, I raised 35 birds out of that pair. And I've got two or three left. And then, uh, come over here, Jim, you can show them. I'll do it if you want me to. I just want to keep it straight. You want to go out there and... Yeah, I'll try to run them back in here. I'm trying to run them, but... Really, the birds have been a little nervous. I've had a lot of hawk attacks out here in the Avery the last couple of days. Like I said, I had a, I lost a good blue bar. Uh, really upset me. Each and every one of these birds are such green pigeons. The worst bird in here is a great pigeon. Uh, I think this is the most blue bars I've ever carried over in going into the breeding season. And again, I don't have the lights on. I don't care if the birds lay eggs right now or not. I'm not trying to raise early, that many early hatches. Uh, and there's a lot of birds here. I'm just going to let them. I'm going to let them mate any way they want to mate, uh, because ever how these birds mate right now, it's going to be a good mating. Um, I don't have that many birds that are full brothers or sisters, so I'm not worried about doing that. And there's a lot of times nothing wrong with mating a full brother and sister. You know, you can mate a, a full brother and sister together, and you're going to say, "Well, you're just getting the same birds back." Well, that's not true. Uh, it is true and it's not true. A lot of times you'll get birds, you can possibly raise a bird out of a brother and sister that can turn out to be better than either one of the parents. It's just like when you've got 10 brothers and sisters in your own family. Not, ever, not all 10 brothers and sisters in your family have the equal physical abilities to swim or to run or or as smart as each other, there'll always be one that's a little better than the other. There'll be a lot of things that they have in common. And that's true when you made a brother and sister back together. You fill them with that blood again. And you're not gonna have birds that's gonna have three heads and webbed toes and 11 flights and frills and all that stuff. You're gonna get good pigeons. There's, a, here, there's an old there's an old mating of mine right there. They're back in their own nest already. I'm glad they're not laying right now. I, I really, for the most part, don't wanna raise a bunch of, of uh, young birds right now this time of year. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to shoot this video is because the last video we shot, we had such a, a great response to it. And if you like this video, uh, what, what is Jeremy, you, you put down, I like the video and, like and, subscribe. and like and subscribe. And please do that. It, it gives us a reason to keep on shooting videos of these Sions and racing pigeons in general. And, and I enjoy talking about pigeons. You know, it's a big part of my life. Uh, I like photography. I like pigeons. I like archaeology. I like spelunking. I like scuba diving, and I like catching lobsters. And, you know, those are the things that uh, that I enjoy in life. Always have, and the things that I I know a little bit about. And I love birds in general, not just pigeons, but all birds. Um, you know, one of the things I like about birds is is, is the colors. Uh, there, there's such fascinating uh, array of colors over the 9,000 species, you know, and that's one reason I like butterflies, and it's another reason I like wildflowers, and I like uh, scuba diving. I, I see so many brilliant fish when I'm when I'm scuba diving, all those little reef fish and stuff, and the colors definitely do attract me. I love that pigeon in the background, right so that's why I'm keeping it in the background. It's one of the birds that... Here we are back over in this room. I don't usually show the rooms that much. I usually try to keep them out in the Avery's, but it's raining out there. You'll see the one pair that I've got on the nest right there. There she is. Uh, that hen and her mate last year raised a bird that finished uh, 700th in the Hoosier. Uh, and I've let that pair go back together. Uh, I think on another given day that those birds could have turned right around and, and you know, done better than that in the Hoosier. Um, one of the things that was good about that uh, babies that came out of that pair, uh, it was uh, two birds, uh, both the nest mates, they, they flew the whole race series and, and both of them finished the last race, which is, you know, pretty good in itself when you've got like 80% losses of, of the best birds in the United States. And the, and the two birds out of that one pair that I sent, both of them went all the way through that race series. Uh, 700 is absolutely nothing to brag about, and I'm not bragging about that at all. I am... Uh, I do believe they were great pigeons. Um, the one thing that they did do that that was uh, that is worth talking mentioning is that uh, they had a good average speed. 
Uh, in fact, they hit a better average speed than a great many of the birds that finished well in front of them. Uh, if you take time out to, to look at how well they flew. Jeremy, if you'll come over right here and stand by this door, keep them from coming through this door. I'll get a lot of them, you yeah, stand right there. Cause I'm gonna walk around here and a lot of them, will, a lot of these birds will come back up out in this aviary over here and I'll show them off that way. They won't have any choice but to come over there. I've got a little bit, uh, a little bit too many birds in here right now. Uh, probably need to have at least a dozen birds out of here uh, to feel a little more comfortable. I do not like having this many birds together. That little bird has got the little spot on her head up there. She's a full sister to summertime. Uh, she got picked on the head real bad. She came out of the nest and I came in the fall and she got picked. And that feather has grown back crooked. I raised babies out of her this year. I call her tough, T-U-F-T, -T, because of that little tough. But that feather has grown back crooked, but I raised babies out of her this year. And they were some of the very best blue bars that I raised this year out of any, out of any of the pigeons. She's a super, super excellent breeder. So that, that doesn't mean anything to me because she's got that little spot on her. In fact, it gives me real quick recognition of where I call her tough. Again, I don't think there's anybody uh, that even begins to have Sion's. Again, it, these birds are pronounced Sion, S-I-O-N-S, Sion's like a C that have Sion's of this quality. One of the reasons I'm shooting this long video today is again to show the world just what a family of Sion's looks like the ultimate, the, the greatest family of Sion that's ever been uh, created by any Sion breeder. I'm trying my best, and to show what a family of pigeons looks like. You know, people talk about families, but they don't see them. You're getting to see a family of birds. A family of birds are all uh, related to each other, and they're all uh, similar in the woods. And there's one man behind it, usually, like no sweat, you know. It's somebody that's kept the birds all his life together and is selectively bred to maintain a high quality of birds that he likes. You know, you go back five, six, seven, eight, ten generations, you're going to start seeing birds that are all bred by one person. So they're all the birds that met his uh, criteria and quality. It's a, it's a, it's old school. It's the long way. The, the, the raised pigeon here comes to rain hard. Now I'm gonna walk over here and show some of these birds that neighbor again. They're gonna be. Able to, I'm, I'm enjoying doing this. The lights, a lot, the light is a little poor, but a lot of times in poor lights you'll get good colors. I hope you all are enjoying just getting to look at these birds. I'm trying to do things that other uh, pigeon videos don't do. They, they rush through. Uh, they really don't have the quality of pigeons to show off like this, but I'm just trying to show the birds. If you know, if you're looking at them, eat. that's good, John. That's good. Here they come. All Sion is a. Okay, we'll leave out of here. I, I don't know what else to talk about when it comes to blue bars. Like I said, you make blues to blues, you get blues for the most part. Uh, and you're looking at my breeders, that bird there in the middle, that's kind of little, right there she is. Got the head of your waddle. That's the hen I call Black Eyes. Her band number's 33. She's a bird that flew 700 miles as a young bird. Uh, I don't know if you know anybody else that's got 700 mile young birds. I sure don't, but right there's one of them. And she's been a fantastic breeder. She, read, she bred a, a blue bar cock that flew in the last South Africa race that beat all the birds that was raised by Mike Gaines. Um I think the bird finished 89th or 90th or something like that. Went through the whole race series. Uh, and she was with that blue cock I talked about earlier, number 96. Well, we'll be leaving here. And you can see the nest set up in here. Nothing fantastic. The birds love it in here though. There's another bird that's out of lurch. So that, 
I wanted to show that darker blue right there. Is that a lurch and really slick looking racer? It's a late hatch and it's going to be a good one. At a lurch in Little Chattanooga. Really my ideal. I mean, not only is it a sea hunt, but look at those two birds. Real racy, classy birds. And lurch is full of 600 mile blood. Real consistent, strong bird. Um, this, these two birds right here. I can't wait to start to breathe out of them. That's a late hatch, this darker blue. He's the darkest, duller blue that I've got. Sometimes you get a blue that's a real, real gray, dark blue. They call those blue bars, they call them smoky blues. Dull blue or smoky blue. But that bird's not that. That's just a little darker shade blue than the rest of them. And that bird's got a lot of little Chattanooga in it. And when you hold the bird out, you'll even see a little bit of the, the penciling in it. I mean, Chatter she's got those back on Chattanooga. Look how slick that bird is, though. I mean, it's a young, young pigeon. Again, you'll see that the bird's double banded. Well, we'll go back down to the other loft. Talk about silver bars for a little bit. is no sweat again we're going into another loft this is my silver loft this is the loft we had to walk up four steps we're walking into a barn that's been converted into a pigeon loft and the birds love it i really believe that the bigger the rooms are uh the better uh, when i was up at the hoosier this year i was very impressed with the way jim had that giant avery out there hooked onto that one loft and i thought man this is exactly what pigeons like. And I could see the birds were very healthy and loved that big giant Avery. And I said, you know, that, that's, that's what birds want. And I'd love to have a loft set up like that. These are all silver bars in here. Every single bird in here is a silver. Uh, there's no late hatches or babies in this loft. Uh, there's several silver here that were mated with each other last year. Not many, about mm, three or four pair. Let's see, I think I've got 20 something birds in here. I think there's it's 13 parrots all together. Um, no real super powdered silvers. I got some that don't have any dark colored silvers at all or dull silvers, but there are some in here that are lighter silvers than others. None again, what you call a powdered silver, where the hackle is, is, is all real brilliant white. That's what, that turn I showed you at the start of the video is Patty and, and her and that beautiful silver cock she's with. They come closer to the uh, being the silver. But now these silvers will produce a powder silver every now and then because a lot of them go back onto a powder silver and that powder silver will pop out every now and then among these babies. Uh, these birds love this loft, this space in here, this big Avery. That's a brand new Avery we just built this summer, treated lumber and, and quarter inch wire and stuff. Uh, I'll get them to fly. That's Fatty's son that I was telling you about. That's, I, I need to call him single tail. He's one of the most perfectly built uh, birds that I've ever bred in the last many years. A good strong pigeon. Really classic old time sea on. That, that kind of head. Get out of here, boy. Shoot off him single tail. I, I've never had a bird that had a single, a single tail more than him. You know, he really comes back. He doesn't look like he's going to. Jeremy, I'm going to, you stay right there. I'm going to, when I walk over here, we're all going to fly out in that Avery. I already know. You stay right there. Watch them. They'll, they'll go over there. Thank you. Whoop. A lot of people love silvers. Uh, it was questionably the favorite color of Paul Sion. Uh, many of his very best pigeons were Sion's. La Rosalette and uh, the Grizz Sion family. Uh, I, the silvers go, and Charles Heisman had many silvers that were, were fantastic uh, flyers, long distance flyers. Um, I think out of the three colors that I keep, the silvers and the brick reds and these silvers, I, I think by far the birds that seem to be 
wraithier in appearance and, and indeed have flown really well at, at 500 miles for me have been these silvers. Uh, most of these silvers I've got right now go back onto two silver cocks. A lot of them, you'll find it in their pedigree, one or the other. And that's uh, the bird I talked about, Hardcore. I named him Hardcore because he flew back in that all by himself in that hot sun. You know, I called him Hardcore. He was hardcore to get home. And uh, they, a lot of them go back on him. The, what I call the uglier ones, they go back on him because he, he wasn't the most handsome of, of pigeons. And then the one that was a beautiful powder silver, the 500 miler that flew six times, the 300. And they go back on him too. And uh, they're nervous. All these birds are nervous right now a little bit. They're not wild, but you know, what's been going on here the last week, uh, they've had re repeated Cooper Hawk attacks hitting against this Avery. And so that's, that's freaked them out. You can see right there, I can show you in the wire. You can see with the wire squunched up right out there, Jeremy, see that? Where it's stretched? Those are Cooper Hawk attacks where they've hit into that wire. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll fly into it hard. Now, there's a blue, a double banded blue bar cock right there. I mean, silver bar cock. And he's out of 300. Again, like I said, if you see a double banded, I don't think I have but maybe three birds straight out of. And he's, he's going to be my oldest uh, silver cock in here. These are all birds that uh, will be, uh, these are mated pairs for the most part uh, that, uh, that are my breeders this year. Notice the top again. Uh, you can see it right there in those birds. Uh, one of the things about silvers is when you when you're flying those silvers and they're out here flying they look almost solid white in the air and they really draw a hawk in almost like you were flying solid white pigeons um, so that's one of the bad things about raising silvers is uh, that they show up in the sky again they're a red gene pigeon and when you make two silvers together most of the time you're going to raise silver bars out of them but you will also raise you will always raise bars you'll never raise a check pattern out of two bar patterns anytime you made a, a silver bar to a blue bar or blue bars together or two silver bars together if the if the if the mating is true you're always going to raise bars they'll always have bar patterns you cannot raise a velvet or a check pattern out of two bars and that's the uh, same thing with silver bars. If I make two silver bars together, more than likely. But I do get, um, mm, I'll get one out of probably about, one out of ever about five pigeons I raise out of these silvers will turn out to be a blue bar. And when you raise a blue bar out of two silvers, again, there you go with that color sex links opposite law. I'm making two dominants, two uh, dominant colors again. No. Not a dominant pattern, but dominant color. And what I get out of that, if I get the blue bar out of two silvers, it's always a hen. And a lot of times, it's a funny thing, a lot of times if I raise a, a blue bar out of these silvers, uh, I don't know why, but I get, a, those birds are really good flyers. Uh, particularly on five and 600 miles, they turn out to be really good birds if you raise a blue bar out of two of my silvers. It's, uh, it's gotten really dark outside. I don't know how much these colors are draining. One thing we got going for us right now is it's warm. It's almost like nighttime in here. Easy birds. And that's one of these reasons, if I had these birds, I put these birds together December 9th. Today's December 17th. So you can see uh, hardly any of them laid, there's no eggs laid at all. But if I'd had the lights on, I'd probably already have eight or nine pair of birds down on eggs or close to it. And right now, I don't think there's a single pair in here that's getting ready to lay. And I'm glad, I, I really don't, like I said, I'm not after trying to raise a bunch of early eggs this year. Winter here in Kentucky is tough. Busting that ice on the tree, busting the ice in the water and taking up to them, and me having to walk up the hillside carrying five gallon buckets. You know, I'm 71 years old. 
it's hard. And uh, I don't like cold weather. I particularly don't like the ice storms in the air. And I, I hate losing baby pigeons in the ice. Uh, you know, when, it, when it's down here and it gets uh, 10 degrees below zero, which it does, and down here on this creek and in the, near the woods, it gets colder than it even, it's another five degrees colder than it is showing every other place. So it's uh, really hard when the birds get off the nest to get a drink of water, to eat some food, and they've got little bitty babies. Uh, you run a really good chance of the eggs getting chilled and dying or the babies dying that are, you know, a couple of days old. You know, pigeons, oddly enough, are one of the few birds that, in a roundabout way, it's not 100% true, but in a roundabout way, go from being a, a cold-blooded creature, a reptile, to being a mammal. Uh, when they're first born, they're at the mercy of the weather, whatever the temperature is around them. That's pretty much what's going to be the weather. Uh, that's what they're. That's how they're going to survive. Whatever that temperature is, that's what they're exposed to. They're not. They're not able to uh, maintain their own body warmth. They, they, they're bare skinned and have a little bit of hair on them. But as they get to be about you know three weeks old, then they've got feathers on them and they can hold that heat in their body and then they they become you know again more like mammals. So they go from being you know at the mercy of the weather to being able to hold their own body heat. Again, I'm, I'm talking. Again, I'm very proud of these uh, birds. Uh, it takes a, a lifetime to build a family of pigeons. Uh, that's one of the reasons people don't have families. They want a quick fix on on birds. In the pigeon sport, they want to have. Uh, get instant success. They think if they buy one winner from somebody and get another winner from somebody, they make the two together and they have instant success. They don't want to have to spend 60 years of their life mating birds back and forth the same old group and keeping the best ones to come up with a group of pigeons like this. This is very old school, this old family of birds. And I've enjoyed it and, and now it's become a distinction that I, that I have here of having pigeons like this. I wish Sion and Heisman could come here and visit the law. Uh, they'd be all smiles because I think they'd see, you know, they see a lot of themselves still back in these birds. You know, I've molded them into being the no sweat Sions, but they still very much carry uh, many of the characteristics that uh, the old Sions had. This little hen right here in front that's facing me right now, she's a classic old Sion type. That little round head and that smaller bird like that. I've seen many a five and six hundred mile bird that looked like that. That was pure Sions. And this bird that just flew up here, this really beautiful bird that I'm centered on right now, she looks more like the Robert Sions. You know, I've talked about, you know, how at the end of World War II he went back around the French underground and gathered his pigeons up. But, uh, Jeremy's got this bunch corralled over here. Again, I've got the dog bowl nest in here and the pine needles. We're putting a new floor down in here. We've put the wooden floor down, but now we're trying to get some metal to put over the wood. Um, I wouldn't trade this group of Sions for any Sions in the world. Uh, why would I? Who, who's got Sions better than this? And how could any Sions else, anywhere, improve this group of Sions? Who, who's got Sions that fly five and 600 miles as young birds, compete against the best racing pigeons in the world and hold their own? and have this kind of look to them, have this beautiful look to them. Who's got the Sions like that? Oh, so when somebody mentions, and I, I have people that say, you know, I'd like to uh, get some of those Sions and cross them to some other Sions I got. I said, why would you do that? You know, because all you're going to be doing is hurting your birds. Uh, you're going to be hurting the pigeons that I've bred. Uh, I would never do that. You know, I think people think if they get a Sion here and get another Sion over there, they'll put two Sions together. They'll make a Volks, you know, I tell them, you're like making a Volkswagen to a Rolls Royce and thinking you're gonna get uh, a Lamborghini out of it. That ain't gonna happen. There was a beautiful bird. I'll pick up one or two of these birds and we'll talk about them and then we'll shut this video down. Hold this. He's very much what I like. Uh, type-wise, size-wise. Uh, he's a medium-sized bird, and uh, I'm real anxious to breed back out of him this year. Handles like a dream. Again, he, all my birds are a little heavy right now. I've been giving them a little bit too much feet. 
vents. You can't, you can't get tighter vents. I'd have to have a, you know, I'd have to have dynamite. I'd have to have a nuclear bomb to uh, spread those vents apart. They're, they're welded together on this pigeon. He's super tight pigeon. Beautiful, beautiful face uh, that a lot of people love on a Sion. That kind of face. I could have put him with that fatty hen down there. You know, again, if I get a C on silver, it's got a little bit, that's called a mealy, I talked about that. Single tail, oh, what if, this bird, I can tell you, goes more back on to that cock bird I was talking about, 300. I, I know his grandchildren and stuff. They, he has much more of that 300 look. He's getting out of one of my double blue-banded birds. Uh, about any way these birds select to mate, it's, it's gonna wind up being a good mating. There you go. That bird there, that was one of those birds I had. Well, I'm in another room in the barn loft, a big room. Uh, I've been here with the whites. Uh, keep, John and I keep these whites in here for a couple of reasons. John loves the whites, they're his babies. And he loves to watch them fly, and I do too. And the hawks do too. And the hawks hit us hard when we let these birds out. They hit us hard this year. And we had a raccoon, two different raccoon attacks. They climbed, somehow got up on the roof of the loft and came through that trap there. And just an old, you know, regular old bob trap. You can still see where that coon bent these traps out to get back, to get out after he came in here and killed about 20 something birds. Well, we caught the coon. We put traps out there and caught him in a live trap. And John actually took him over to Berea and let him move over to the wildlife place over there. He had more heart than I did. Uh, but now I've got a big piece of heavy plywood, you know, built on the front there. I can let it down over here if I want to let that plywood down. You know, but you can see how it works. See how it lets, it lets, lets down the burst and go out that way. And if I want to block it off, keep any, I just pull it back up. It's like a bridge to a castle or something. And I lock it back over here. That keeps any coons from coming into the loft. And uh, again, the two waters we got here, we got the tops on them. Uh, th these birds have a lot of room in here. There's three hens right now sitting on eggs, which John's tickled to death about. We're trying to build these flights back up. We had about 50 of them, and between the hawks and the coons, we're about down to about 20 or 18 or something of them, not many. And, uh, don't have many here that's very old, a few, few of the older ones. Uh, one of the good things about these whites uh, that you won't see very much of in the United States is that these whites, a lot of them, um, a great many of them I've let loose down in Chattanooga and below Chattanooga, which is 200 air miles, or 200 miles, uh, to fly back here to Richmond, Kentucky, and you don't see many whites that have flown that far back. And I did have two whites that flew all the way back from uh, Key West, Florida, which was 1,000 miles, and uh, it turned out to be two males. So uh, I tried to mate them together. I didn't realize they were two males. And, that didn't turn out too good. They, they fell in love with each other, and I named one of them Rock Hudson, and I named the other one Liberace. And uh, Rock Hudson, I eventually got to mate back to a hen, but Liberace, he fell in love with Rock Hudson, and, I mean, with Liberace, and he never would. So, I told, uh, I told John, I said, John, I think them birds hung out flying around Key West too long down there. So that was the end of that. Hopefully, building two watch together to raise a thousand miles. But this is these birds have Sion mixed in with them. They're not 100% Sion. A lot of them. Some of them are uh, are straight Sions uh, because of the way I've been able to breed them. Uh, but uh, we had, we had a few birds that weren't Sions in this. I don't let these birds mate with the others. All the whites again. But there's at least half of these birds now are probably what I would call straight Sions which is unusual to find. The husband only raised two solid white seeds in, in his whole life. They both came out of two, out of a pair of red checks. They were straight albinos. You know, and the eye sign on the, uh, the eyes on an albino are pink. And uh, I don't have any of these birds that actually have a pink eye. Most of these birds have that dark blue eye. But I have some birds here that have, you know, eyes like you see on normal birds. Yellow eyes, chestnut eyes, you know, brown eyes, whatever. Uh, violet eyes. Uh, you know, like you would see. And I would, I, I would venture to say that if I took all these birds this summer and took them down to uh, Chattanooga 200 miles, uh, 
we would get most of them back. It might take two days, but I would get most of these whites back. And there's not that many people, I don't think, you know, flying whites, two and three. There are some, there are some good whites out there, but they're pretty rare. You know, one reason is classic hawk bait. And uh, so, they're beautiful birds. A lot of people are attracted to the whites, that's for sure. And, uh, We'll always, we'll always keep them, you know. I, sometimes I'll slide some eggs from the other pairs over to them. And uh, uh, this is a great group of whites, you know. It's about as nice of a group of whites as you'd want to find. Um, talk any more about the whites, but that's, that's it on them. And when you make whites to whites, and you're still going, when you make whites to whites, you're going to get whites. But with these particular whites, because I've crossed in blue bars and silver bars and different colors, and, you know, if I'm, uh, a lot of times if you made a solid white to a silver, and you'll get a silver back out of them. You may get a silver that's got white on it. You may get a white that's got a little bit of silver in it. You'll get a, a, but you'll get a solid white back out of them, as well as the other colors. And that's that's what we did here when I made it. A, when I did bring in a blue bar with one, a straight C on and stuff, to, to really help their homing instincts and to, and to bring them up to make them straight good racing pigeons. Uh, I kept the whites out of those mazes separated them and put them back together here and that's how that's what these whites are like i said john's john's very proud of them and, uh, you'll see uh, one or two of the whites has got a little bit of a little spot on their neck and, uh, and by spot i mean a brown feather or a gray feather and that's that that's that straight old sea on of another color it happened to pop out on them we had one white who got killed by a hawk i guess because it disappeared we had one hawk one white it had black, it came really unusual around his face. It looked like it had a perfect mustache on it. And we really loved that bird, but it's gone now. Well, it's it's getting late in the day, it's raining. Jeremy, this video is the longest video I've ever shot. I really didn't mean, I told Jeremy this is probably a one hour video at most. And it's turned into what he said, it's gonna be over two hours. It's a feature film, you're gonna to have to get an old butter popcorn and one of them big giant Coca Colas you get at the theater, one of those 10 gallon Coca Colas, and, and sit back and watch this. And this would be with Gone with the Wind, the Ten Commandments, and Ben Hur, and now No Sweat, you know, whatever, with the pigeons all over again. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, you know, I enjoy talking about raising pigeons, it's a huge part of my life. And uh, I'm really, really proud of this group of birds. I couldn't be more prouder, uh, more, more proud. And uh, they're all getting ready to go to roost. So Jeremy and I are getting ready to go to roost here in a few minutes too. We're gonna to have to go back through the rain to get back to the van. Um, again, I appreciate you all looking at it. I love them. I'm, I'm really thankful for people who put positive comments on watching the videos. That means a lot to me. Uh, like anyone who raises racing pigeons who's been successful. You know, I've, I've now won over 1,100 first places with racing pigeons in my lifetime. And, uh, I think that speaks for itself. I've won shows and races of all kinds. Uh, you're always going to have people that are jealous of you, and you're going to have small-minded people uh, that are going to say something smart or negative about you, uh, you know, on the spur of the moment or just for whatever different reasons. And I've gotten used to that. If you let that get you down in the sport, then you don't need to be in this sport. You have to move forward. And I admire people like Mike Gaines and so many other people. Uh, that I know have had to absorb a lot of jealousy in the sport. And if I say anything negative about anybody in the sport, like Mike Danis, I certainly don't mean it in a bad way. Uh, he's been a fantastic person in this pigeon sport. Uh, he's He's been a new Charles Heisman. He's taken uh, marketing birds and doing so many things that Charles Heisman could have only never even dreamed of. Uh, I still think Heisman's the greatest pigeon fancier I ever knew. but. Uh, Gaines is certainly one of the greatest pigeon fencers that's ever lived as well. Uh, he goes about fooling with pigeons much differently than I do. You know, I'm, I'm into keeping the family together and being just a, an old country boy, an old man down in a holler, you know, keeping his birds and loving his birds. And I'm pretty content at that. I wouldn't care if I ever flew in a club race or a combine race or a big race ever again in my life. I'm, I thoroughly enjoy being just with my pigeons and I get a lot of pleasure just taking the birds on my own out 50 miles or 100 miles you know, or especially five or 600 miles and letting them go and seeing which birds come back i don't have to be in a race to enjoy seeing what birds come back and, and putting up with a lot of 
nonsense from people that have little things to say about people. Um, I love the birds. I always have. I've loved them since I was seven years old. I got pictures of me with racing pigeons when I was seven years old, and I'm close to 71 now, so you can know how long I've had them. Uh, and I'm real proud of the fact that I never dreamed growing up with all the people that had Sions, uh, which it seemed like that was the dominant strain in North America. Everybody had Sions. Everybody seemed like if you was anybody, you was. It didn't matter who you was. I mean, I, it went on and on every time you picked up the Racing Pigeon Bulletin or the Racing Pigeon News or whatever pigeon magazine you subscribed to, there was advertisements for Sions. So who, this guy had the Sions. It was a matter of who had the best Sions. You know, and those guys all competed against each other. And today, you know, there's only a handful of people that really have true old Sions, and none of them are, none of them are really doing what I'm doing with them. They, they really aren't. And uh, uh, I'm, I never dreamed I'd be in that position of being the guy who wound up being the flagship of, of the Sion family. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad to be carrying on that tradition, and I hope at some point uh, somebody else will build, you know, have five or six lofts and start raising, you know, 500 Sions a year and I'll be able to go to my grave knowing, hey, those Sions are going to go on long past my death. Right now, though, I don't see that person and don't feel that person's out there. And I feel an obligation to, you know, to the men, to, to Paul Sion and to Robert Sion and to Charles Heitzman to, to keep these birds together, to keep their names alive together. And I think I've, I've tried to keep their memories alive. Every day I'm alive, they're alive. That's how dead people stay alive is the people following them, you know, remember them. So here they are, the silvers, going to roost. You can see that pair's made it together. They're lovey-dovey. This pair's made it together. They're all lovey-dovey. That pair's made it together, lovey-dovey. And that pair down there is all made it together. You can see when they're made it together, you know, they're roosting together. They go back into the nest together. And I love seeing that at this time. I just, I, in fact, I'm, I couldn't be happy. None of, them, none of them's laid any eggs, but they're all in love and looking for each other. It's going to work out good. I've got about an even number of males and females in here. Uh, I try to keep this couple of females more than I do males. It works out better that way. I hate seeing a, a male that doesn't get mated during the year and he sits around and didn't have a mate the whole year. That's, I don't I feel sorry for him. He's an old bachelor that never could find a, find a girlfriend. Uh, but I think it'll all work out in here. I think I've got about an equal number if I did everything right. Again, thank you for looking at the video. That's it. It's a, it's a wrap. Cut her off.